start recording. I'm going to start recording the, the event. Guys, we are live already. Welcome, everyone. Um, as I told you, we today are going to answer questions and answers. Uh, this is something that we designed uh, uh, for uh, our three and a half anniversary that happened in Maine. Uh, and, and nothing, I mean, today we're gonna to answer the questions that people sent to us through Instagram, Facebook, or uh, Twitter, and even uh, through chats. Uh, so we are gonna have, we have like 15 questions, 15, 60 questions that we divided by categories. So we are gonna start uh, answering the questions related to the team. Uh, and uh, and from there we're going to talk about uh, answer questions related to to projects, social media stuff related to Orinoco Tribune, uh, our finances, and uh, at the end we're going to uh, answer the questions related to news. I mean, uh, Venezuelan events or Latin American events, things like that, global you know issues. So. So that's gonna be like the, what we wanna do, do today, guys. Again, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. Uh, we are uh, today, uh, the pleasure of having with us Steve Lala and Sahili Chowdhury that are both um, the oldest members of the editorial team of Orinoco Tribune. Uh, the ones with more seniority. I'm not saying, Sahi, that you are old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what else? Mm. Okay, so let's start with the first question. But first, I want to remember everyone that Orinoco Tribune is a independent website. We don't receive funding from governments, from you know, big foundations or companies, corporations, or things like that. We completely relied on on your our readers, your help, your financial help, and, and that's very important for me to highlight because some I believe that sometimes people believe that because I was diplomat once in my life, I should be like receiving tons of <laughs> money from the Venezuelan government or something like that. That's that doesn't happen. So, so that's why uh, it's very important that you help us with donations and we are very thankful for the people that uh, has been helping us since the beginning. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with the questions. And the first one that I have here uh, is uh, some uh, Teresa Taylor send us that question and it says how did you pick your first team members i i did not pick them they they picked me <laughs> <laughs> actually <laughs> uh but yes going back to the first i mean orinoco tribune uh, began with uh, like like a like a, an idea of you know presenting news about venezuela that i knew were not very <laughs> Uh, common, especially in English language. So I began actually uh, the project with my wife and with my sister. Sorry, with my daughter. <laughs> uh, and uh, and my daughter, which was we, we, she grew up in the U.S. and have a very good English. She was the one that helped me with my with the proofreading part until she was tired of doing so. She is, of course, uh, a, a younger adult and, and she might have, at that moment, other interests. So at that moment, when she abandoned me for a while, <laughs> I was told by a friend that lived in the US, uh, Costner, uh, he refers me to, uh, to Beth Elizabeth Ferrari from California. And he told me that she, that she might like to join us as, you know, helping me with the proofreading part of Orinoco Tribune. 
and uh, and she did it. I mean, she I contacted her and she joined us, uh, and 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 she spent like one year and a half or something like that uh, with us, uh, and that was absolutely uh, amazing and necessary because, uh, uh, as you can hear, uh, my English is not the per the best one, so so. So she helped me a lot, you know, uh, uh, with proofreading of the things that we translated in Orinoco Tribune, because we in Orinoco Tribune, I believe that is important to say it. Uh, we try at the beginning to to pick uh, Venezuelan news pieces and articles uh, in Spanish and translate them to English. That was the original, you know, uh, idea. Then I start adding. Uh, uh, I mean, news and, and and articles in English about global issues that I believe are somehow one way or the other connected to Venezuela, to anti-imperialism, socialism, and things like that. Um, uh, but but after after that, uh, we began writing our own content, and uh, also we uh, began we lose. How do you say that? Uh, la pena timidity uh, we lose uh, we we stop being shy in intervening in the pieces that we translated and we also translate you know pieces and uh, add Orinoco Tribune content to those pieces whenever we find that they need a little bit more of background and 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 uh, and sometimes editing and additional information, whatever. So that's basically what happened. And then, uh, and and then when 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 uh, Elizabeth uh, was extenuated for one and a half years uh, uh, of helping me, helping us in Orinoco Tribune, uh, I started begging around for uh, volunteers. Uh, through the website and and Steve and Sahili were the ones that came in so I let them uh, talk by themselves because I talk too much right Steve uh, no 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 it's great to have you speaking uh, Jesus um, I, I would just say really quickly in response to this question of how do you pick your how did you pick your first team members that again, like Jesus said, uh, it's he's not out there um, selecting from an infinite amount of possible choices. Uh, Orinoco Tribune, you know, relies on volunteers that contact Orinoco Tribune and want to work with us. So, if anyone out there is interested in working with us, uh, send us a message. We're always looking for people to help with either proofreading or layout or social media, graphic design. Uh, Whatever skills that you might have, um, we would, you know, like to try to find a way to work with us if, if you're interested. So, uh, and what about you? How do you join us? Okay, Me so personally? What... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did I join? I mean, I, I I don't really remember that well, but I I believe. I just saw a call out that maybe that you put on your Facebook page saying, you know, that you were looking for volunteers and uh, it was one of my favorite outlets. And uh, at that time it was, you know, lockdown pandemic. I was at home all the time. I had extra time and I thought, you know, this is something I, I wanted to do and I never turned back. It was, it was, it, it's been a great opportunity. And that was what, almost two years ago now. So that's true. Go ahead. Charlie, do you want to tell us your uh, origin story? <laughs> so yes uh, how did i join i actually i had listened to the live stream that jesus did on the two-year anniversary i think in 2020 in november and uh, actually i had been following the outlet for a bit of a, like a few weeks let's say not even months uh, maybe two months before that and that was also from uh, our dear friend Nino, Nino Paglicia, who is, uh, he wrote something in, he had written an article in Counterpunch. And from there, I saw that it had already been published in Orinoco Tribune. And I, since there, I started following Orinoco Tribune. And then after 
watching at the um, live stream in November 2021, so, sorry, 2020, uh, I went into the website and saw that they were looking for volunteers. So I thought, okay, why not uh, try and uh, at least for the weekends and to do something uh, with proofreading. Okay, I was quite timid, so I thought that I would only do proofreading on uh, Saturdays. And I think I wrote a very um, respectful and official letter to Jesus. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And since then, uh, Steven Sahili has been a key part of Orinoco Tribune. We have, of course, our team is bigger. Uh, some of them could not join us today. Some of them like to be in anonymity. Uh, but but uh, currently, Orinoco Tribune has like, like seven or eight uh, team members. Now, I want to name them. Yes, uh, besides Steven Sahili, we have uh, Elizabeth that, that she rejoined us uh, a few weeks or months ago, uh, and Elizabeth Ferrari, and we have uh, also um, Khalil Wall Johnson, we have uh, Dana, we have uh, um, Robert Quinones. We also, we had uh, until a few days ago, Gabriel Martinez Saldivar, who was with us more, also more than a year and he's from Mexico. Uh, uh, and, and we have uh, like one or two new prospects that are about to begin working with us soon in proofreading mainly, I believe. So that's basically the Orinoco Tribune team. I'm gonna jump to the second question uh, to avoid, you know, spending the whole hour uh, answering the first one. Yes. <laughs> well, the, the, the next question is, what is and are the reasons for each of the members to work for OT? Also, what do each of you do for a living? This is a question from Ananto Biswas in Facebook, I believe. Can you, can someone, one of you start? Well, um, I think we sort of answered the question of what are the reasons for each of the members to work for OT. I mean, that's true. I guess we had some time we wanted. To, I, I had some time I wanted to give. I, I felt I had the right skill sets. You know, I was trying to teach myself Spanish also. So it was a, an interesting opportunity to work with a little bit of Spanish uh, and translating. I mean, as far as the next question, what do each of you do for a living? I think it's an interesting question. But um, I can assure you that it is not uh, working for Orinoco Tribune. I mean, we are volunteers, so That's I get asked that sometimes, you know, are you professional, this or that? But um, I, I, I'm actually working as a proofreader right now uh, for something else other than Orinoco Tribune um, and uh, working also in film. That's fine. Kali, do you want to? Uh... Okay, yeah, so. Uh... I, I have recently uh, received my doctoral degree in physics. Oh, I had been... Congratulations, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Okay, so when I joined, I was uh, doing my PhD. Uh, like I was in the middle of it and it was a very bad time uh, to be in the middle of the pandemic because my uh, work involved a lot of field work and I had to go to places, but I could not, I could not do any work and I was quite depressed. So that was the reason, that was a big reason for joining uh, Orinoco Tribune. Another, another reason, of course, was that I, uh, not only did I want to like, um, uh, I keep knowing things about Venezuela, but wanted other people to know about it because uh, in media, in like <clears throat> the me media is so biased and not only just biased, it is uh, um, like most of media is owned by a few big corporations everywhere in the world. And uh, so, mm, and they go on repeating the same sort of horror stories that, uh, uh, oh, well, after a point of time, one would, uh, start questioning that are the horror stories really happening so that was uh, the reason I joined the uh, Orinoco Tribune and because uh, of course they were Orinoco Tribune was and is continue, like, continues to do the same thing 
that is informing about the truth of Venezuela. So that's uh, the reason I joined. And of course, at, just after I, I received my degree just a few days ago, it has not even been a week. So at, at present, I am like a glorified unemployed person. <laughs> <laughs> a doctor, a glorified unemployed doctor. Exactly. <laughs> I would like to add, actually, to what uh, Shaheli said. That for me too, it's it's very true that around that that time, I was always looking for information about uh, Venezuela and Latin America because I had been starting to be interested for a few years more in you know Latin American socialist movements and uh, obviously it was easier to find information about Cuba for Venezuela we had Telesur and if I'm not mistaken I had even been sending some emails to Telesur uh, and they never you know responded to my emails for whatever reason but you know when I landed on Ornoco Tribune I mean I, and I think that was a while ago but I remember at that time that was maybe 2018 or 19 so it must have been early uh, in the existence of Orinoco Tribune. But at that time, what you would read about uh, Maduro in the mainstream media was just uh, terrible. And it was very difficult to find anything um, that would you know, defend different or that would defend the Venezuelan process at all. And I had started you know, reading about uh, Chavez and getting interested in that. So uh, that's, that's how you know, I started reading Orinoco Tribune uh, all the time. That's true. That's true. In my case, uh, it's almost the same. As I told you, I, 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 I came up with the idea of Orinoco Tribune in 2018. But before that, uh, I mean, I, I, I worked for several years, for almost 12 years as Venezuelan consul in Chicago. And before that, I worked in Venezuela in different areas as advisor. Uh, but after I returned to Venezuela from the U.S., I, I learned uh, the lack of information that, that was there, uh, I mean, that can be felt in the U.S. about Venezuela and Latin America in general, progressive information, uh, alternative information. So I came up with the idea of Arinoco Tribune. During that time, I was doing translation jobs, most of that was most of my income uh, uh, at that moment. But a few months after I started working with Orinoco Tribune, I decided to quit the, doing translation work because I was not able to do both things. So right now, I mean, whatever uh, we do in or I do in Orinoco Tribune is, uh, is I mean, whatever I do, my, my work is Orinoco Tribune. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Uh, what else, Compass? Let me read the next question. What were each of you doing the day Chavez died? Your first reaction moment you, fi you find out. I mean, what, what was our first reaction? This is, a que this is a question from Evelina Ponte from Facebook. She is a very active follower of us on, in Facebook. So go ahead, guys. Shahili, you want to take this one first? No, no, Steve, you should start. I can start I'll also. Be honest, I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, please, anyone please can. You start. Okay, okay. Let me let me begin uh, with my side of the story. At that moment when Chavez uh, died, I was uh, working in Chicago, as I told you, as uh, Consul General of Venezuela there. Mm, we still had diplomatic relations then with the U.S., we don't have diplomatic or consular relations with the U.S. since 2019, by the way, by those, uh, if you don't, are not aware of those things. Uh, and I was, uh, I mean, somehow we were uh, already expecting a, a bad outcome uh, um, about Chavez health, especially since uh, in December, 2012, if I don't, if I recall well, he went back abruptly to Venezuela from Cuba, where he was receiving treatment, and he spent like a week in Venezuela. And in that week, uh, the last day of the of the of the, his stay in Venezuela, he made a, a, a TV address, basically asking Venezuelans to vote for uh, to to vote for Maduro. 
uh, in the case he was not going to be there anymore. So we knew that something was going to happen. So, but that day, of course, I was uh, uh, fulfilling uh, diplomatic consular functions and uh, and I, I followed the event and I was amazed by the images of people in the street of Caracas, uh, like thousands of people going to the street of Caracas to follow the, the what is the name of those cars that takes the the funeral the funeral whatever the cars that i mean the corpse of uh, of chavez i mean uh, uh, i believe that uh, i'm not exaggerating when i'm saying that tens of thousands of venezuelans went to the streets to follow and to cry chavez dead and it was a maze of that i mean by that and and of course because of my work i also had to do a lot of things like opening uh immediately uh uh how do you say that uh libro de condolencias a condolence book uh for the for you know for people authorities and personalities friends to you know and, and I have a, I, I have it scan. I scan it because it was a beautiful book that we, you know, uh, managed to open there in Chicago with a lot of affection uh, messages. Uh, and then we, a few days later, like maybe one or two days later, we organized like two or three events in Chicago, like, like uh, religious ceremonies uh, to, to honor. Hugo Chavez. So that's basically my story, very briefly. What about you? Um, well, I, I was going to say, to be honest, you know, I, I, I don't remember uh, this particular day. Um, I, I'll fully admit that, you know, about 10 years ago, I just, I wasn't as turned on to uh, the Bolivarian Revolution or even... That's fine. Um, Latin American socialist politics. Um, one thing I will say is that it, it, you know, and everyone has to go through that process, but I clearly remember the depiction of Chavez in the mainstream media at that time, which was that he was insane, basically, that he was just a crazy dictator. Um, and I'm not saying that I believe that, but I definitely rem I remember being suspicious. And I remember when, you know, learning that he had died of uh, cancer at a long, young age, I remember being uh, suspicious, uh, and it was only years later. Um, I, for me, it was the emotional impact. Uh, I remember when I read uh, the the autobiography that he wrote with Ignacio uh, Ramonet, "My First Life," um, which is it, tra traces Chavez's life until he was elected uh, president. So. It's the first chapter of his life, and you know, it, at the end of this autobiography, of course, he's he's saying how he would like to write the second uh, chapter of this book, you know, and, and and that was really when I think the the fact that he had died so young um, really impacted me emotionally, you know, and I, I felt just it's just tragic, uh, just to think, you know, that's nine or ten years ago uh, to think of everything he could have accomplished and would still be accomplishing and. Uh, how tragic that is that he, you know, he was taken so early. So, huh. so now I think it's my turn. Yes. Okay. So, live living on the other side of the world, we got the news a day later, as as <laughs> happens all the time. So we got the news a day later, and I, I I was very young actually. It was a long time back. Almost it was nine more than nine years ago. So. Uh, and I'd say that, first of all, uh, the last I had read and uh, like newspapers at the time were not, like, there wasn't as much in information online or at least we didn't have as much in access to internet and anything. So I didn't even know that he had been receiving treatment in Cuba for a long time. I mean, I had read somewhere that he had been in Cuba and receiving treatment for cancer. And I had thought, okay, the Cuba has uh, like a like a wonderful record of, in um, medical practices and also sure he is going to survive this one and why I say it because like I, I had met Chavez I had met him in uh, 2006 when I was even younger I was a child I was a barely a teenager when I had met him and then afterwards you heard like 
I mean, I'm talking about uh, 2006, I think. So at the time, at least I did not know much at the time, but uh, slowly uh, over the years, I had learned more about it and how he had uh, transformed the uh, country with the extreme inequality and everything to uh, a more just world. And we thought that the similar things could be applicable in like uh, many parts of the world, including my own. Okay. So that new day that um, we got the news, I mean, and my parents are also big fans. So that was like sort of devastating for us, although he was not uh, head of state uh, or anything in my own country ever. So it was like a losing um, a leader who had never been a leader of the country, but yeah, he was a world leader, I would say. It's nice to hear that. It's nice to hear that we never we talk a, a, a lot of times we exchange information a lot between us, but sometimes we forget to stop about uh, talking about these things. It's nice that we are talking about these things, right? Uh, let me jump to the next question, the fourth questions. Do you plan to have a podcast uh, speci specifically on Venezuelan issues or have some monthly video episodes where you interview Venezuelans, maybe in the street, in the market? This is from Ananto Biswas. Uh, of course, we would love to do that. We would love to do that. Uh, mm, but for that, we need resources, I believe. Uh, if we, uh, I mean, I, I, I've been dreaming that eventually at some point we have enough income in order to hire uh, someone to do the things that I do and I can go outside and do uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm talking about the, the local part because we do, of course, uh, our, our monthly talks uh, that we have been doing already for the last four or five months. And we are going to have one tomorrow. We invite you to, to that event that's going to be very interesting. We're going to talk about Palestine and we're going to have a, and a very nice guest, an activist from uh, a Palestinian activist that is currently based in Canada, but was about, that was deported from Germany before that. And in recent weeks has been threatened to be deported from Canada too. So. So, so, so we're going to talk about Canadian issues, but anyway, going back to the question, uh, what I was trying to tell you is that, of course, we would love to do more stuff, especially locally. Before the, the pandemic, I tried to, you know, send videos and show photos in our Facebook account. Uh, about Venezuela in order for people to see what was happening, especially because we were in the middle of the of the of the aggression of the US those days and everyone was saying that Venezuelans were dying in the street because of the starvation and and things like that. And I wanted to show the people uh, around the world, at least the ones that follow us, uh, that, that that was not exactly that. So, but, but yes, we need to do that. We need to do that more. Or maybe uh, with a little bit more of resources, I can hire a reporter to go to be in the streets and, and, and you know, do from time to time that sort of uh, interviews. Uh, I would love to do that. But at this moment, it's kind of difficult. But, uh, but at least we try to, to present you every month at least uh these you know video talks uh, about international issues and we try to do these activities uh, from time to time in order to and, and interviews for for example during the colombian interviews Sahili did an amazing set of interviews to 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 activists u.s activists and people in colombia so, and we, uh, I also participated in live streams with the guys from the Alliance for Global Justice. With had, where they had a, a live coverage from Colombia. So we try to do the most that we can, but it's sometimes uh, uh, we don't have enough hands to do it. I don't know what you want to add to that compass. 
Well, I, I would also say that uh, Jesus uh, forgot to say about, like to mention Chavista Chronicles from Caracas. We also do that. Like That's a true. meeting that is a pre recorded thing done for uh, about an hour, um, four questions to an invited guest, or maybe sometimes two. And they can also ask two questions about Venezuela. So if anyone, uh, anyone we invite, can have their own sort of set of questions also. So please, like in order to uh, just a few, whatever we already do, please follow the YouTube channel. It's like these uh, videos are uploaded on YouTube. They're also on Facebook, not all of them, but these live streams will always uh, remain on Facebook uh, actually. And then our other social media also, like we are everywhere. Uh, we try to be everywhere on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, on uh, Telegram, on Reddit, um, uh, everywhere. everywhere. So Even in so Benap, we are right now. Is, uh, yeah. Benap so, is the I mean, new Facebook. Venezuelan social media, by the way. Yes, well, Venezuelan exactly. social media Ben app is uh, well. I I still find it um, a bit problematic, slow, and all that. But I I believe that it will improve with time. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, like in case like anyone is hearing this, please follow us on social media, and that way you will know at least about the things we already do. And yeah, I think uh, let's maybe with more funds, one would be able to do more interviews like in the streets and stuff like that because. For that, why talk, why I mean, why I'm mentioning funds? It's not only because of uh, keeping the website going, but also in order to uh, do interviews and stuff on the streets, one would actually need a bit more equipment, uh, like a very small microphone, perhaps a recorder and stuff like that. So in order to have those things, uh, uh, people need funds. So. And that is again another request for uh, helping out because uh, these things, uh, like their costs are increasing day by day. So yeah, we would like to do these things, of course, as Jesus said. Yes, yes, that's true. You 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 pass this time, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm gonna jump to the next question. Uh, this is not actually a question, but it's a I I, I call it a recurrent comment. Uh, it says, uh, basically, stop using Facebook and Twitter. They are CIA controlled. <laughs> I, mean, that ha I mean, those comments happen a lot, and we understand them. We really feel them. I mean, we are victims of Facebook and Twitter. I mean, uh, for example, uh, right now in Benap, which is a local social media application that is just beginning in Venezuela, and should have like one tiny millifraction of the you know uh, scope of Facebook or Twitter in terms of reach. Uh, ben, uh, Orinoco Tribune has two thousand followers. Just to give you an example, in a country where a lot of people do not speak Spanish, uh, sorry English. English. <laughs> uh, so so. And in, in Facebook, we only have 2,400 2, something followers. And, and Facebook uh, has been for, since the beginning, uh, the most important source of clicks to Orinoco Tribune. Uh, but for the last year or year and a half, uh, we have been, est I mean, stuck in, to 2,400 followers, and that said something that I'm sure is not related to our performance, but is related to uh, uh, Facebook algorithm and Facebook uh, uh, ways to try to avoid presenting alternative information, uh, the information different from, from uh, what mainstream media tries to sell everyone. So I just... Uh, uh, remember that particular issue and but going back to the questions i mean uh, as ahili said also i mean we try to be everywhere but the fact is that most of the people around the world use mostly facebook and twitter uh, and and in recent times uh, instagram especially by younger people instagram and tiktok we are in all those platforms actually uh, most of the video interviews that sahili did uh, the other day during the colombian elections are in our tiktok 
uh, account. So we have been trying to diversify and present us in all those platforms, but uh, you cannot deny that they are una plataforma para mostrarse. How do you say that in, in they are a, a, showcase, a, a showcase platform maybe? Uh, and, 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 and you are gonna try to be, if you want to be seen, you have to be in as many platforms as you can. So that's basically why we are still in Facebook and Twitter. And currently Twitter in recent, in recent weeks, maybe months uh, has been uh, bringing us uh, more clicks uh, than Facebook. And that's a pattern that I have been noticing uh, in recent days. Uh, and I've been checking some numbers and at least for the last two or three months, Twitter has been displacing Facebook for Orinoco Tribune in the most important source of clicks to the website. So that's important. And we have been growing in Twitter. And, but uh, I believe that maybe uh, they, they have not realized who we are in Twitter. And, and that's why uh, the algorithm has been not working against us yet. But anyway, uh, uh, that's basically uh, my answer. I don't know if you want to add something, Compass. Shaili. Well, I actually, I would say that everybody, uh, I mean, every alternative media, like all sorts of alternative media, they try to be everywhere, including in uh, CIA controlled channels. So like, for example, and this was mentioned um, maybe a year ago by another of our good friends, uh, the Bolivian journalist Camila Escalante. She mentioned that her channel, her own like Causachun News, it also tries to be very active on Twitter because that is also a, like a place where they get a lot of clicks. So, uh, and many people have done that. Like every every uh, journalist from an alternative platform or independent one around the world try to be on these places. Yes, sometimes their contents get taken down sometimes. And of course their contents are always suppressed by the algorithm, but still um, I would say that every opening, every path is important. So that is why we need to be in as many places as possible and diversify just like Jesus said. Yeah, so, and um, the reason for diversifying is exactly that, that when the time the CIA controlled channels are going to um, expel us from their platforms, we'll have these other places and our staff will be there also. So yes, if anyone uh, suggests any more platform where we already aren't, they can and we'll try to be there also. Yeah, I would just like to add to that, that it's a comment that we receive obviously a lot and for a long time and it's not, it's not like it's something we don't think about that all uh, alternative media outlets have to think about that and come to their own decisions um, based on how they believe usually that they can reach the most readers because I mean, that's what it's about at the end of the day. Secondly, I would say that uh, to anyone that wants to subscribe to Orinoco Tribune News. Um, there is the website, I assume most people know that, orinocotribune.com, and there is a newsletter which we send out through email, which is also a great way to get sort of a digest of the week's news, and you can sign up for that newsletter very easily on the homepage. So um, I would true. just say that. Yes, that's true. I always forget about the newsletter. But it's important because uh, if you want to have direct information from us and avoid uh, depending on Facebook or Twitter, deciding if you should uh, receive our the information from Orinoco Tribune, the best way that you can avoid those companies deciding what you see and what you don't is subscribing to our newsletter. Uh, and, and we only send one newsletter a week. We try not to, uh, you know, uh, bombard, in, in, invade your privacy, your, you know, your, your inbox and things like that. Bombard inundate. you with, with inundate your inbox with information. No, it's only once a week. Um, so let's go to the next question, which is now uh, on the finance donations part of the of the conversation. The first question is not a question, it's a recurrent comment again, and it's one that says stop using PayPal and Patreon as donation platforms. Again, I mean, um, 
is, is the answer is very similar to the, the one that we gave for Facebook and Twitter. I mean, we know that. I mean, we know that PayPal, we know who is the owner of PayPal. We know uh, what interests represent PayPal and Patreon and all those big platforms. But we need to be where most of the people are. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so that's why we use PayPal and Patreon a, a lot at the beginning, thankfully, knowing that uh, these platforms uh, uh, ban independent, socialist, binding, anti-imperialist projects like Orinoco Tribune, and they have been doing that a lot lately. Uh, we, a few months ago, uh, reach an agreement with the Alliance for Global Justice. And we are right now uh, a tax, I forgot the name, exact name, but is it a sponsory tax? I mean, uh, the Alliance tax for Global- Tax deductible. Exactly. The Alliance for Global Justice has become a tax sponsor for Orinoco Tribune. What that means in, 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 in in material terms, uh, it means that uh, all the donations that you made to Orinoco Tribune will be, or most of them will be tax exempt. We uh, they, they, uh, tax deducted. I mean, they are tax deductible. So, so, so at the end of the year, when you are uh, receiving your uh, your your tax checks in the U.S. at least. Uh, you will be, uh, uh, re you, I mean, that, that amount of money will be reversed to you. So, so, so that's important, especially for you, but also for us, it's important because it opens an alternative channel to PayPal and Patreon. And also it's good for us because uh, the, the service fee that, that the Alliance for Global Justice charge us uh, is, uh, less expensive than the, the fees that we pay for Patreon and PayPal. Actually, Patreon is the most expensive one of the platform we use. Patreon, Patreon takes like something between 13 and 15% of the amount of money that you see there. Uh, and we try to make uh, that amount of money transparent to let, I mean, we, we, we can decide to show how many subscribers and how many donations we receive or not to show, but I personally prefer that people to be transparent and to let people know uh, uh, the amount of donations that we receive through Patreon. And, and also in PayPal, I also choose to let people know how uh, close to the goal uh, we have reached in every you know year cycle that we begin in in our PayPal account. So 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 I mean that's why we are in 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 in, in PayPal and Patreon. Thankfully, uh, and I invite people to go through uh, to switch. Uh, I mean, to if you want to make donations, uh, our prefer method for donations right now is this program with the Alliance for Global Justice and you will see it in our website to the right side that there is you're going to see the, the the Alliance for Global Justice next to the lo the logo of the Alliance for Global Justice next to our logo and you will see there that it says uh, tax deductible donations or something like that and go there if you want to do donations because it's going to be uh, better for you it's going to be better for us and at the end of the day the fee that the alliance for global justice charges us is going to go to projects that we are very uh, aligned with you know what i mean i mean the alliance for global justice is an organization that finance projects that are uh, connected to our struggle to the struggle of uh, you know uh, people, uh, anti-imperialist people uh, in Latin America mostly. So I invite you to, to use that platform. I don't know what you wanna say about it, Compass. I'm, I'll just say for these last two questions, um, there's gonna be a question later on when we get into our news content 
um, that uh, we're going to answer. And that question is, why does Venezuela send oil to the U.S.? And I think there's an interesting analogy to be drawn between that question and, you know, why do we use Facebook and Twitter and why do we use PayPal and so on? I mean, these are difficult choices that have to be made, but um, we're, we're not working in a perfect world here. Um, uh, we, we need funds to operate. We have a limited amount of time that each of us has in our lives. We have uh, to do, um, we have to operate in the same world with the same real um, laws that everyone else does, uh, unfortunately. So, um, Shahili, maybe you wanna add something or should we move on to the news section here? I'll just add one line and that's not, that's not an answer, but maybe a comment is that everybody needs to survive. So yeah, people will do whatever they can to survive. So this, this, these platforms still remain important, although they may ban, like they may ban for like a word or something like that. PayPal at least I know has done it, like for using the word Syria in a headline, PayPal has banned the webs, like the account of uh, Richard Medhurst, I know that. So yeah, someday it might be, uh, might not be, correct to write Venezuela in a, in a headline either. But anyway, until that time, we would be there, we would try to be there. And But just like Jesus said, please go to the tax deductible donation thing. That would be best for everyone. So please do that. If you wish to uh, donate, much better than PayPal, much better than Patreon, much better than everything else, go to the tax deductible donations and to like donate any amount it will be put to good use thank you one thing i would like to add also sorry uh jesus is that you know uh we do, we don't run any um ads or monetize our facebook page and content or our youtube or our twitter so we're not giving a share of a cut of that monetization to any of these outlets um, and again, there's a, I mean, a very complex uh, and uh, controversial theories behind all this that many people have written about and spoken about, but, you know, we're not living in the perfect uh, communist uh, utopia where there's um, no uh, pri uh, private property and the means of production are entirely in the hands of the workers and all that. I mean, we're hoping to work towards that, but in the meantime, uh, we, we do need to survive, as Shahali said. You're muted, Jesus. Yeah. You're still muted. Uh, take out that uh, headset once and uh, put it on again, Jesus. You're still muted, Jesus. We can't hear you. Nobody can hear you, Jesus. Wait, we... Wait, do you hear me I think me it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, now? yeah, yeah, I can hear you. It's not a muted scene. It, it is that uh, talking out. We were talking about money. My 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 <laughs> headset is already rotten, and I I'm twitching the 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 thing, <laughs> the plug Don't that it, that is loosened, and and that's why uh, uh, I, I could, you could not hear me. Sorry about that, uh, but I just wanted to add that that uh, also PayPal and Patreon. Uh, I mean, most of the people in in, in things related to money, uh, a lot of people uh, don't trust new websites and things like that. And people, especially in the north, uh, know about PayPal and Patreon, and they trust those platforms. And and that's another issue that make us uh, stay there also. But whenever we had a chance to have an alternative, better, less uh, CIA driving platform. Uh, we will, you know, choose that one, of course. But as Steven Sahili said, we need to survive. And talking about survive, I wanted to mention that, that I mean, it's critical for us to get more funding and to eventually pay our staff. Like, uh, I, I would love to have enough funding in Orinoco Tribune to at least give some 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 payment to Steve Zahili to I mean to the team, they are all volunteers and the only one and it takes me to the next question. I'm going to jump to the next question, which is how those OT or Orinoco Tribune survive financially. 
I mean, and, and, and basically in Orinoco, and that's a question uh, that one person plays in, in Instagram, I believe. Uh, and, and, and it takes me to the, I mean, to this, we already, things that we have already uh, discussed here, but, but the only one, I mean, that uh, rece received the income, I mean, I'm the only one receiving a payment. That's what, <laughs> that is, that's what I want to say. I mean, a salary from Orinoco Tribune. Uh, of course, uh, 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 me and my wife, my wife also worked for Orinoco Tribune, by the way, I forget to mention her. And my daughter also helped us a little bit with our Instagram account. Uh, but my daughter is living a road, uh, uh, so the money from the from from Orinoco Tribune, the, the not very uh, big amount of money that we receive uh, via donations goes to maintaining the website and allow uh, us allow me to be talking first person to survive, and we don't have a, a fancy life. Uh, or something like that. We're basically surviving, trying to, you know, to reach the next month, like most of the people around there. But in our case, it's more complicated because we are in a country seized by, by the U.S. and 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 and, 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 and the North global North countries. So it's more complicated uh, that for us. But that's how we survive. I mean, we that, that that's the the secret out of the success is that I'm abusing Steve Zahili and a, a lot of good people around the world that help us with volunteer work. But but without that, we will be uh, not there. You know what I mean? So 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 it will be amazing if we uh, could have some uh, at a steady amount of, of income in order to, you know, to let us run a better, you know, operational uh, financial scheme that allow us to, to have a, um, a better team, a better pay team beside only me, you know? So, uh, so that's basically how we survive. There's another question from Ananto Biswas in this, same, uh, you know, vein, and he asks about how much does it cost in a month on average to run a site, uh, and and basically uh, our hosting services uh, goes uh, around thirty thirty five dollars every month. We pay for hosting services. You have to add to that, that those are like recurrent, you know, costs that we pay every month. Of course, the internet uh, that I use has been uh, like a, a year ago, it was equivalent to one or two dollars. And currently it's equivalent to like $15. So, so uh, the prices has been increasing a lot in Venezuela and the government has been trying to, even though this is a, uh, a uh, public company, uh, 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 I mean, state-owned company, Cantebe, the one that provides me with internet access, uh, they have been trying to increase the prices because uh, there is no other way for them to keep the platform running. And for several years, the prices were uh, incredibly low. Uh, and I understand that, but from the other side of the, of the aisle, uh, it affects us, of course. So we're talking about right now about what, like uh, 35 through 15 is going to be like 50 bucks every month. And, and what else? Uh, mm. Ah, you forget electricity. <laughs> then no, no, but that, that's afford... something. Yes, that, but, but, but that, that, that's something that, I mean, it's not directly related to, to the to Nokia Tribune, but also we have to add, um, we use some services that we pay annually, uh, plugins that make uh, the website works. And, and uh, I, you have to add, uh, might, might have to add like 15 more dollars a month. I don't pay them monthly, I pay them once a year. Uh, but it's going to be something like like 15 more dollars. So if you want to have a website similar to Orinoco Tribune, you 
might need like something like 65 or 70 dollars a month go ahead I've been asked this recently, you know, what are the operating costs of War Noco Tribune and so on, um, especially from people that are um, investing or giving funds or fund, uh, helping out or Noco Tribune with um, donations. And I mean, the reality is, or, or maybe if it's people that want to start their own similar website, the reality is the actual costs expended uh, are not huge. The major cost is labor. Yes. And it's the time that each one of us puts puts into Orinoco Tribune, especially uh, Jesus, but also all the volunteers that help with translating. I know in the past we had estimated the amount of hours that each of us put in. And, you know, I know for Jesus and it's his family, it's a full time job. So that's, you know, what, 40 hours a week or more. Mm -hmm. So um, and for each of the volunteers, you know, we put in a few hours each week, um, which adds up really quite significantly and maybe you know if we're say just as a ballpark figure it's 100 hours a week that we're putting in in labor uh into collecting all the information translating it um, formatting it uh, proofreading it and plus managing all the social media accounts so i mean i'm not, I'm not uh too great at math but you know at 20 dollars an hour of u.s wages of a hundred dollars a week. I mean, that's two thousand dollars a week. So over the course of a year, that's you know that's a hundred thousand uh, dollars of money that we could could you know. And uh, again, in looking at it, we are all living in different countries and different economies. But at a base rate of twenty dollars U.S. an hour, that's money we could be. Um, uh, that's labor that we could be uh, being remunerated for yes, if we yes. were putting it towards uh something something else something more profitable <laughs> exactly exactly that that's a good point that you made there because i mean besides that if you are talking about uh, having uh, and, and and deciding to launch a project like this besides the platform codes that i mentioned you that are it's not very big you will have to add the the, the, the resources for the human capital, I mean, the, the resources for paying a team that essentially in our case uh, is volunteer work. But even in, in our case, uh, I, I don't want it to be like that forever. The ideal will be that we have some income uh, in order to have a, a paid team, uh, uh, at least a, a little bit paid team, you know? So anyway, that's give you what, what Steve just said, give you an idea of how, how things work in, well, in the I would just financial add in that part. At least I'll, not, I'll say for myself, I'll not say for everyone. Like, I'm not looking for money here, but uh, what Jesus is mentioning and like money is important, not just for eating, but also the fact that I think uh, this question was asked and we were trying to answer it just before it that uh, what if we are going to go out into the streets and trying to interview people or there are so many events that take place in different places but um, like that Orinoco Tribune would like to cover that very few people cover and the uh, Orinoco Tribune would like to give them a better diffusion broadcast I always lose words <laughs> anyway so uh, in that case also a little bit of money would help in uh, traveling expenses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, like instead of like having a payment every month or something like that, one could have a, what is called a, a fund, fund for mm -hmm. a fund from where one can draw in order to do this kind of work for the website itself in order to make it better, in order to produce more content, in order for the news to go to more places and to more people than it already does. Yes. So yes. that's it. That's, that, that's a good point also i was thinking about that and it's true i mean you can you can you can have it i mean if, if we have a a, a found we could uh, you know paid one of our team members to go to mexico like uh, recently uh, there was this event in tijuana uh, for this uh, counter summit of america's event that was organized in tijuana and if we had that found operating we could have uh, decided to send someone from the team to go to that event but we don't have that money we, don't, we basically have money to go to the to the to the corner and buy some bread in the bakery <laughs> i'm exaggerating but 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 anyway i mean that's part of the of the thing 
Um, I believe that we need to jump to the next question, guys. But uh, again, uh, I try to be as transparent as we can in terms of the resources we receive uh, in order for people to see how much money uh, uh, they are donating and, and things like that. So, but whenever uh, any of our followers uh, believe that, uh, that they need to have more information about our finances, please reach us and we will always be, we, we will always try to answer uh, your concerns or questions about the, you know, Orinoco Tribune finances. Uh, what else? Uh, let's jump to the questions about uh, and related with news, with, with local, regional, or global issues. The first one is, it is okay to have Brazil as part of the BRICS because the president is pro-American. That's a question that came, I believe, from Instagram. Uh, do, so does, uh, do you want to answer that, Sahili or Steve? Or are you prepared? Yeah, I, I definitely have some comments. Okay, on that, Steve, you Sahili, definitely you have, please do. <laughs> no, no, no Steve, you go. Please do, definitely. <laughs> well, the, the first thing I would say, and, and, and I, um, we're getting into the news section now. We've already been talking for an hour. We're going to be yes. here for a while because this is, this is the part I think that everyone has a lot to say about. But um, I know, Shahili, you can have some input on this also. But, you know, uh, it's it's a bit like we were talking about before about the perfect world and everything. I mean, BRICS is not uh, some type of uh, anti-imperialist, uh, Marxist, Leninist uh, union. I mean, yes, it happens to have China inside it, but it's composed of uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, Brazil is, um, you know, uh, it's a, uh, a system of government where the leadership changes um, due to elections that happen. And when BRICS was founded in 2009, I believe, um, you're muted, Shahli. No, she doesn't. When BRICS was, when BRICS was founded, uh, Lula da Silva was uh, the, the, the leader of Brazil, who was, you know, uh, more of a traditional progressive socialist leftist leaning um, leader, and it made sense uh, for for um, at that time. I mean, it made maybe more more sense for Brazil to be aligned in this sort of anti-U.S. Um, group. Um, uh, Bolsonaro took over in 2018, and Brazil did not leave BRICS. But uh, from what I understand, it stalled. This did stall the advancement of BRICS. Um, it's pretty clear now that uh, Lula is going to be back in power in Brazil shortly, in just a few months. I think in 90 days is the election in three months. So he's probably going to be back in power, and that's probably going to allow BRICS to accelerate again towards creating. Um, possibly an alternate currency, definitely creating, or I mean, they already have, but strengthening the BRICS uh, World Bank sort of alternative that they have, and possibly creating an alternate currency for um, Latin America also, which uh, Lula has said that he wants to do. So, and, and I, the last thing I would add is that, you know, ironically, as I was discussing just the other day, ironically, Bolsonaro is proving not to be the strongest US ally here where he's getting to the end of his uh, regime uh, that it seems like since the um, end of the Trump presidency, Bolsonaro has actually been um, leaning away from the the U.S. Uh, for the Summit of Americas. At one point, they said they would not have send their head of state. I think in the end that he ended up going. Maybe someone else could uh, clear that up for me. And lately, what they've been doing is. Um, I believe insisting that, uh, or they, I believe they just signed a, a deal to import uh, oil from uh, Russia and basically defy the sanctions. Um, and and they're also asking uh, for fertilizer products from Russia. Uh, so they're they're being crushed by these sanctions that the U.S. is imposing on Russia due to the special military operation, and and they're. De defying these um, economically, probably be because Bolsonaro wants to try to boost his popularity a little bit uh, in order to enter the elections. And uh, I mean, you know, just the other day, I guess there was speculation that uh, they had declared a state of emergency due to, I, I guess, the inflation and economic um, 
struggles they're going through that, you know, they might use this state of emergency to delay the election. But um, anyways, I'm sure both of you would like to add something to that too. Shaili, why don't you why don't you go first? Well, I would I would just say that firstly, this kind of trade blocks or whatever blocks, I mean any sort of multilateral body is not between governments but between states. This has to be always uh, this has to be repeated many times because state and government are different things. So once a country gets into a multilateral block, of course, an, another government, a different government, can withdraw it from that block. No doubt about it. But um, it isn't that just because a government changes, a country would automatically get out of a block or something like that. It cannot do that. So BRICS is, of course, BRICS is a trade block, just like Steve mentioned, it's not an anti-imperialist block or Marxist-Leninist block or anything. It's a trade, trade uh, multilateral, or at least with different countries, a uh, trade block. So one need not, like there is no, mm, there is no minimum qualification to be in, in the trade block in terms of ideology. So, and at least, of course, in 2009, when the block was founded, in just like in Brazil, there was a leftist government. There, in India, there was a central left government, and then like in the, it was for uh, the first time that the left was in a central government in India. So at first and only time, I should say. So it was the United Progressive Alliance, the first of it. And the left uh, with 66 members of parliament had participated in it. And it was that leftist push that made India go into breaks, uh, despite its um, bad or not so warm uh, foreign relations with China. But of course, it always has had extremely favorable relations with Russia, just like Brazil had. For example, Brazil is uh, the largest amounts of exports from Brazil goes to Russia. It did in terms of Lula, it, it, it was the same in terms of Dilma Rousseff, but also in term, time of Bolsonaro, actually it increased in time of Bolsonaro, the trade volume between Russia and uh, Brazil and trade volume, especially between China and Brazil, like China is Brazil's biggest trade partner. And Brazil is the fifth largest economy in the world, despite that terrible extreme inequality in the country. So, um, I mean, these are the conditions that make BRICS a block um, with a lot of uh, like wet, in, at least in terms financially in the globe, like the BRICS countries account for 25% of the world uh, economy at present. So. Uh, and also the two countries with the largest population and then Brazil also had a very large population. Uh, so all these things I would say that like no country would just get out of a block like this from where like it, it can trade between among themselves and have other uh, um, other advantages. It, no country would just get out of a block just because the president is fascist or something like that. I mean the present Prime Minister of India is also a fascist, but that does not mean that he is going to take out the country out of BRICS because whenever you want in a trade block like this, you get the benefits that you would not be getting just getting into a free so-called free trade agreement with the US because in most cases, those agreements are very biased and tilted towards the dominant powers, whereas in case of BRICS, that is not happening. So that is um, that would be a reason that neither the president of Brazil, nor the prime minister of India, nor the prime minister of South Africa went out of BRICS. I would I would add uh, to what Sahili is to say that that BRICS uh, is mostly like a corporation form, you know, like a like a like like a club of countries, and 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 I believe that. The main objective of BRICS is to push towards a multilateral order, a, a, a world different to the unipolar world that the U.S. is trying to impose, and that is evidently uh, being falling apart. So, so in that way, BRICS as a cooperation forum between very important countries in the world arena in the worst scenario uh, uh, becomes so important 
and and it's true. I mean, it's not if it's, it's, it's not impossible that a, a country a government state uh, a government deciding in the name of the state uh, withdrew from BRICS, for example. And that's not impossible. And actually, Steve mentioned that, uh, and, and, and that's a fact, I mean, that, that Brazil was almost, uh, stole uh, BRICS for almost uh, three or two or three years, or maybe more, three or four years. Uh, but lately, maybe because of you know political calculations, uh, Bolsonaro has been trying to 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 present a different approach, more you know, more independent, more not that submissive to the U.S. But I believe that there is also this you know uh, contradictions between uh, Bolsonaro and and Biden, uh, and, and Bolsonaro was in love with Trump. And, and, and now that Trump is not there, they has been having like a rocky relation with the Biden administration. And that's why he didn't want at the beginning to go to the summit of the Americas. And then the, the gringo sent a delegation to twist their arm and to, and to give some concessions to Bolsonaro that end up uh, going to the summit at the last minute. So that's basically what happened. Uh, but I mean, anything could happen with BRICS now BRICS is thinking about uh, opening the space for the incorporation of Argentina. And I believe that the other country is Iran, right? So, so they are, they are Iran and Argentina have formally requested to join BRICS and that's something that is gonna move uh, the, the block uh, in a more solid, you know, direction more. So, so, so I believe that, that, that BRICS is a, is, is a good body uh, uh, in order to promote uh, the multipolar world that we, I believe, and many of us believe that will change the balance of power in the world. That doesn't mean, as Ahili and Steve say, that that was gonna be the socialist body or the anti-imperialist body, but at least it's gonna be a counterweight to US unilateral control of the world. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, yeah, a couple things I want to add. I, I saw a list of countries that wanted to join BRICS, and I think they didn't formally apply yet, but the list was maybe a dozen countries, including, you know, surprising countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey, I believe, and large economies like that. Another thing I would add was regarding, you know, like uh, Shahili said that, you know, uh, you're not going to leave um, BRICS just because you're a fascist. Um, I mean, it, to, a, to a certain degree, it makes me think of ALBA TCP, the Bolivarian Alliance of Latin America. But, um, and we see the difference here, I think, with between BRICS and ALBA. BRICS comprises 25% of the world economy, about half of the world's population in there. If you're a country like Brazil, uh, Russia and China are huge trading partners. For you to leave this organization would have terrible consequences. In the case of ALBA, we see, um, you know, in the uh, so-called backyard of the U.S., uh, Latin American countries, as their leaders get replaced uh, and change, the countries are frequently joining, rejoining, leaving ALBA. Uh, I think uh, right away of uh, Honduras in 2009, before the coup, Thalaya uh, said he was going to join ALBA, or did he actually join? I'm, I'm not sure, but he certainly was planning on joining ALBA after the coup. Honduras did not join ALBA in, in Bolivia in, in the coup in 2019 when uh, Añez took over. I think it was one of the first things she did was pulled uh, Bolivia out of uh, ALBA. So these are smaller organizations that, that um, countries can leave uh, easier, but BRICS is, is a, a massive uh, operation. And the last thing I would like to say before maybe we go back to you, Shahili, is a, it's a question for you about the, uh, that has nothing to do with this topic, but about leftist leaders in India. I mean, would you would you consider Nehru, who I've read, you know, as described as a socialist, um, would you consider that a leftist leader of your country oh. or not? Uh, sorry, I, what did you, mean? whom did you mention? Nehru, I mean, the first president, how may they, how do you oh, pronounce okay. his name? Okay, okay, I, I got it. Or prime minister. Okay. Yeah, he was the first prime minister. I mean, the system, the Indian system is very similar to the Canadian one and the British one. 
So it is uh, the head of state is prime minister. The titular head is, in case of Canada, I think the titular head is Queen. In case of India, the titular head is President. But that that person is not directly elected by the people. Anyway, so no, I would not consider Nehru a socialist, but he was more like a social democrat. So uh, he was a social democrat, but he was pragmatic in the sense that the first thing he would do is uh, have a very strong relation with USSR. There were um, lots of differences of uh, politics and all, but uh, and in many cases, India has like better position. For example, I would always mention this, that in case of Israel, USSR was one of the um, driving forces behind the formation of it. I, I'm not saying that uh, the USSR was colonizing the land unlike Britain or anyone else, but uh, it was a driving force. It had voted for it, etc. India um, just, uh, independent for not even months had voted against the formation of Israel in the UN in General Assembly in 1947. So like this sort of positional differences they had, but uh, the ideologies were very different and the uh, Indian system is also different. So no, I wouldn't say he was a socialist, but yes, he was a social democrat, center left, and his party at that time was more center left than it is now because it was his party, not him, he had died many years earlier. So in 1991, his party was in power in the country when uh, neoliberalism was introduced. So yeah, right. I mean, it has changed a lot. It has moved from uh, center left to center right in many, in economy, it's more right. So that's the sort of thing, but in uh, social positions, it's center left. Good to know that. I'm going to jump to the next question. Uh, it's about mercenaries, uh, Venezuelan mercenaries. Uh, uh, this is a question from Kayla Quesada uh, uh, from Instagram. Uh, and she, she made the questions like that, and I rearranged it a little bit this way. Venezuelan mercenaries in Ukraine and gringo mercenaries in Colombia uh, uh, and Ukraine. So, so she wanted to know about these two things, and and uh, I want to talk first about the Venezuelan so-called mercenary in 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 Ukraine. Uh, we are talking about Jose David Chaparro. Mainstream media gave him a lot of coverage at the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, he is a Venezuelan that has been living in Ukraine for several years or decades. Uh, and, uh, and he is, according to media reports, the commander of a, uh, of a volunteer team to the you know, military reserve of Ukraine near Kiev you know, helping uh, with uh, procurement of, of, you know, humanitarian assistance to people affected by the war. And they can call him the com Comandante. Uh, he is a right winger, declared right Venezuelan right winger that participated in the, in the Guarimbas in 2014 where, when he was leaving. I mean, he returned to Venezuela for several years. Uh, and then after 2014, uh, uh, when he participated in the, in the Guarimbas that tried to oust the government of President Maduro, uh, he went back to Ukraine and he, he, and he was living back in Ukraine since 2014. This is, I'm telling you this because I listened to a radio interview that he, where he was explaining all these things uh, to a Venezuelan right winger anchor. Uh, very, 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 very happy of hearing these stories. And recently, uh, and, and this interview that I mentioned you was from, uh, I, I believe, like like two or three weeks ago. So it's very fresh because most of the media coverage was uh, about him was uh, by, uh, by late uh, March or early April. Uh, but this interview that I'm mentioning you uh, is very recently. He is still doing that job, even though Kiev is uh, not uh, affected anymore uh, as at the beginning of the conflict uh, uh, by, you know, direct uh, Russian military, you know, uh, presence. But he's still working, uh, doing that uh, job. 
And I saw a list uh, uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation uh, with the list of foreign combatants that they have identified uh, operating in Russia. And there was one Venezuelan, and I believe that that's him. Uh, uh, and, and, and they published that on their Twitter account. I, I retweeted it a few days ago uh, in Orinoco Tribune account. Uh, and they put there the numbers of foreign by countries foreign uh, mercenaries uh, operating in Ukraine, uh, the number of them that has been eliminated, the numbers of them that has been going back to their countries and the remaining, you know, the, 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 the remaining number of, you know, the difference between the ones that arrived, the one that, that, that has been killed and the ones that has been uh, fly away. So they, they, they did this, uh, this they put that information online and I, I found it interesting and Venezuela have one and I believe that is this guy name again Jose David Chaparro and, and, and he uh, apparently story in the Soviet Union during the last days of the Soviet Union and he is married with this Ukrainian woman and he lived there for several years he worked uh, uh, in the embassy of Venezuela from 2001 until 2005 during Chavez time. Uh, I believe that they took him because he had the language and he had the knowledge of the area. So, uh, and, and during those years, there was a lot of, there were a lot of right-wingers in Venezuelan foreign services. I'm not saying that they are not still there, but uh, right now there are less of them around there. And, uh, and that's the story of this guy. And the, and the other guys uh, has been covered uh, more vastly by mainstream media and alternative media. Uh, the other guy is Craig Lang and Alex Schieferhofer. I believe that how you pronounce that crazy name. Uh, uh, and those guys, especially Craig Lang has been followed by alternative media and even mainstream media uh, because of their participation in the Maiden in Ukraine in 2014. Then uh, they're traveling to Colombia in 2018, by the end of 2018, uh, receiving weapons from Colombian authorities. That's not, a, I mean, that's not an invention of left-wingers and commies, tankies. I mean, that is in the affidavit the statement that they present to, to, to the justice. They, 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 I mean, they initiate a legal process against them in the US. And what I'm telling you is their statement. Uh, so, so they receive uh, uh, weapons and some training in Colombia in order to kill commies in Venezuela. Uh, uh, but they end up uh, returning to the U.S. and uh, uh, and they did not, but they they did not finally went to Venezuela. But they were close to the operation Gideon. Uh, so that's basically. But the, but for some reason they went back to the U.S. Maybe they didn't receive the money that they were expecting. But we, because we are talking about basically mercenaries that you know pay killers and and when they went back to the u.s they were charged for us an assassination or something because they allegedly allegedly kill uh, a couple in florida and stole some money in order to pay for their tickets to go to to colombia it's a weird story but uh, at the end of the day is the story of mercenary people that are trained by the u.s and the you know uh, armies in the north to uh, train to kill people and that are out there and no one talks too much about them but they are a reality of crazy people that love to kill and that love to receive money for killing so so that's basically what the, the, in general the information that i you know gather about this particular case kayla that's for you <laughs> I don't know if you want to add something to that compass. I'm not an expert. The, I'm, uh, I, go I, sorry. <laughs> well, no, no. I think that person also mentioned Colombian mercenaries in Venezuela. 
Well, the Colombian mercenaries seem to be everywhere in the world, wherever there is trouble. Uh, that's a very unfortunate thing, but most of these people uh, um, had actually received training in the army, Colombian army or Colombian police. Police is also very militarized there and has been trained by US and surprise Israel. Okay, so um, the Colombian mercenaries had, uh, by now it's known, I think everywhere in the world that Colombian mercenaries had killed the Haitian president turned dictator, Juvenal Moise. And they were also in Bolivia just a few days before uh, Luis Arce was to um, like get inaugurated. So like his mandate was starting just a few days before they were there. But in that case also, they did not receive payment. So they left, they did not do what they were going to do there. I think they were supposed to kill Arce and kill others so that the government could not, new government, elected government could not take charge. And, of course, Colombian mercenaries are definitely in Venezuela. It's easy to be like it's easy for them to be there. The borders are border is long, forested, and one can understand that it is not a militarized border like in the case of U.S. Mexico border. So yes, uh, Colombian mercenaries can easily go from one country to another. It seems. So yeah, I think Colombian mercenaries might also be in the in Ukraine. I don't know. I mean, Jesus saw that list, yes, so yes, I'm sure yes. there were Colombian mercenaries in that list also. A lot. Uh, go ahead, Steve, if you want to add something. Yeah, just I would just add something quickly, not really about details. Um, I have nothing to add in this respect, but just in general, um, that the use of mercenaries, you know, I think it's hard to keep track of. Um, it's very important to understanding uh, geopolitics and also I think imperialism. Uh, we have to recognize that uh, there, there are armies that uh, function on behalf of countries that in some cases have a certain degree of transparency that they're expected to provide before you know Congress or parliament of their respective countries. And then there are mercenaries that sometimes are hired by um, you know, the Department of Defense of the U.S. are hired by different uh, countries, specifically and by their governments, um, that usually don't have that same degree of uh, oversight. It's very difficult to keep track of what they're doing as a result, but it's also really um, very important to try to get that information and share that information. I think it's also really important to remember that, you know, imperialism is a connection of giant uh, multinational uh, companies and corporations. And as, as such, uh, they do use the military forces of countries in order to impose their will on uh, uh, other, other nations and other peoples. But um, these interconnected corporations can also and would also love to use uh, mercenaries and private armies, uh, private contractors, uh, whenever possible to, to impose their will um, also that way. So um, I know I, I learned a lot about Blackwater, which is now called Academy from reading about them, but there's countless of these giant companies and security uh, firms that employ thousands of people that, you know, there's still uh, maybe 1500 that we hear about officially that are left in Afghanistan. So, you know, when we hear about the US troop withdrawal and so on, it doesn't mean that there aren't still imperialist forces in Afghanistan uh, working to impose the will of, you know, the uh, imperialist capitalists on the Afghan people. So I think it's a really important topic. Yes, listen, Sahili, and now that you ask, and I just checked 65 uh, Colombians, 14 oh. killed, uh, nine fled, and 42 remain. Okay. That's the number of Colombians in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and yeah, now... I, some, I, I think I mentioned, I had to mention this thing, like many in the army in Colombia, like leave the army and go into um, like these sort of organizations that contract them, mm -hmm. particularly because where the payment is low and I don't think there is like the sort of, uh, like the sort of patriotism that should be in our people who join the army. I, this is not racism against Colombians or anything. Like a lot of times people say that, why do you say Colombian mercenaries that this is racist? But this is just an information that uh, in, in many cases, it's actually poverty that leads to this sort of things. The, the people take this monthly salary, it's a salary that they are assured of 
of which they cannot get in in more honest employment or they cannot find honest employment so they would go into this sort of things it's actually very sad to see countries and especially their uh, workforce being wasted like this there's also a problem of um, indigenous violence is that the word is that understandable i mean uh, the, the... There, there's a, a culture of violence that has been in cycle, em, I mean, embedded, endemic, endemic. In, exactly, endemic violence that, that has been affecting Colombia and Colombians for decades already. We're talking about 58 when uh, they killed uh, Jorge Eliezer Gaitan and the Bogotazo happened and all these uh, guerrilla movements and see, basically the civil war started in Colombia and have not stopped. We are talking about uh, that soon that's going to be 70 years old. Uh, uh, a 75 struggle. years, and, yeah. 75 years and continuing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, 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 and that, uh, of course, put a lot of, uh, I mean, it's very common uh, uh, violence. It's very common in Colombia. And sadly, uh, that has been uh, uh, spreading to Venezuela in recent years. And I'm not saying it in the way many anti-Colombians or anti-Venezuelans talk. Uh, I'm saying it sa uh, in, in very sad terms uh, because uh, I really believe that Colombia and Venezuela are sister countries. We are the same people, and 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 whatever happened, bad happened in Colombia, end up affecting Venezuela, and whatever good uh, happened in Colombia, uh, should also uh, be affecting positively Venezuela. So anyway, uh, I believe that we need to jump to the next question because we're not going to spend the whole uh, afternoon here. <laughs> uh, uh, the question is: Will Argentina manage to re to get rid of? Uh, I mean, to read of the IMF colonization? Go ahead, Sahili, because I know that you love the issue. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually wrote, uh, I actually wrote for, I wrote this stuff for Renoko Tribune and I had to read a lot about it and I, I continue to follow it because this sort of debt, like the debt that countries, from which countries suffer is uh, something, like it's, a, it's another way in which uh, countries continue to remain colonized even after they had got rid of formal or more visible colonization from the colonial empires of the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. So in, in case of Argentina, well, there are many ways in which Argentina could get rid of this um, debt because it already had, it already had gone through the similar same experience not like just 20 years ago. So it can uh, do that. And there are many other examples from many other countries around the world also. So the first thing that Argentina needed to show before accepting, like before Alberto Fernandez accepted another loan from IMF in order to pay back the loan that uh, the earlier president Mauricio Macri had taken from IMF, which ended up uh, getting hidden in um, tax havens. So before, like, just before uh, accepting to repay that debt, Alberto Fernandez should have said that we won't because it was an illegal debt. And he had all the data in his hands to show that it was an illegal debt because the Central Bank of Argentina had given him an entire report that is also in the website of the Central Bank of Argentina. Anyone can go there and check it. So what uh, it had to, to us show it is illegal. And I, I have the numbers, I always have the numbers with me because I, uh, I went into the website of IMF and everyone to look at the numbers. So first of all, Argentina should not have received, like Macri should not have been able to get the loan that he got from IMF in 2019 and 2018. And why is it so? Because that, uh, but the, the sort of loan that Argentina got in 2018, was called, it is called a standby agreement. It stands by because it's given to you now and then you have to, you get a grace period and pay it back later in equal installments. And there are, uh, like, there is a schedule for it also. So in that case, in case of uh, in 2018, why it should not have received is this, that a standby agreement 
country can receive uh, for a year, like for 12 months, the amount of standby agreement loan that a country can receive is 145% of its special drawing rights. Now, a special drawing rights in is like a savings account that you have in a bank. In case of this, countries have this amount, so deposit this amount of money in the well, uh, International Monetary Fund as their membership uh, accounts. So in 2018, the amount that Argentina had in SDR, like special drawing rights in IMF, was uh, equivalent to 4.46 billion US dollars. And if you apply the rule that it could get 145% in 12 months and 435% in the whole agreement period, in this case, it was four years, it should have been 19.4 billion only, okay? But it got 56.7. So that it was illegal from the beginning that it got 56.7 and IMF did not say that it was an exceptional access or anything because they also have a policy called exceptional access on uh, st standby agreements, but this wasn't so, like it isn't mentioned like this. And also, mm, like it knew that the IMF team that was looking at, um, that was uh, managing this thing and they had been doing a quarterly review, like every three months, they were reviewing the situation of the Argentine economy from starting from the time when it received the loan. They were saying that it is unsustainable, firstly. Secondly, that all this money was not really going into the Argentine economy. And it was not boosting the economy and not even like, not much is going into the economy, but they were being taken away by the biggest business people in Argentina and being hidden in uh, tax havens around the world, including in the US, in Delaware, Miami, London, as well as in uh, Santa Lucia and uh, uh, San uh, Antigua and Barbuda and all these places that you know to be tax havens. So, and um, IMF's, own, IMF's own article, one of its article, article six, it is called, it's, it has a statute. It is a terrible organization, but it has a statute. And its statute article six says that the loan that, it gives to any country in whatever way should not finance capital flight. Now, this was a capital flight. The IMF's own loan was being taken away to um, tax havens, so it was a capital flight. And the team was uh, you know, the team was warning it every month or every three months that this was happening. But even then, the IMF board did not pay attention to it and continued to disburse the loans. So these were the two information that uh, the Central Bank of Argentina gave to Alberto Fernandez even before he had become president, like, because IMF also knew that Macri would not be winning in 2019. So in May 2019, before Alberto was elected, he was in presidential campaign, and IMF team met him, and he had said that uh, I won't be paying, I won't be taking more loans from you and stuff like that, and that you had you had given a loan illegally, breaking your own laws forget about laws of Argentina, you break broke your own laws and gave it to us. And then in 2020, there is, a, we have the confessions from Macri himself, as well as from the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, Mauricio Claver Carun, who was in that time in 2018, he was the, in the IMF board uh, on behalf of the US, he is from the US and he was very close to Trump. And he said, as well as Macri said that this loan was like a campaign donation from Trump to Macri so that he can remain in power. But of course, they also knew that they, he couldn't because he was so terrible. So uh, then they uh, structured the loan in such a way that any government, any progressive government that came to power after Macri would have its hands tied. This was the language that they would have its hands tied and would not be able to do much reforms in the country in terms of economy or anything. And that has that is what has been happening in case of Argentina. And especially that Alberto Fernandez did not neither say that we'll not pay that pay back the date, nor did he say that we'd start a tribunal because you can do that. One can do that sort of thing. And like hearings and a tribunal on this sort of things it happened in Ecuador in 2007-8, in terms of Rafael Correa, he had also faced this sort of pressures from the IMF, asking him to pay back loans that the Ecuadorian state had taken since 1960, 1976. 
to 2006. And he had said that he would want a renegotiation and one can do that because he had shown his tribunals, those tribunals that the government of Ecuador carried out during 2007, eight had shown that much of these loans that uh, IMF had given to Ecuador had gone into capital flight or had been given illegally breaking its own laws. So uh, in 2009, the Korea government received a 65% what they call a haircut, which means 65% of its uh, loan in the IMF was just removed from its account. So it was like an amnesty sort of thing. Uh, in Argentina could have gone that way also, but it did not. It had a third way in 2020, which was the pandemic. It could have appealed to international law and, and other humanitarian laws uh, that in times of the pandemic, this sort of negotiations can, could be suspended. So this and all these things, like he did not go into this way. What can he do at present? Instead, he had taken he has taken the loan, and this loan I just mentioned that uh, it is it took forty five billion from IMF, and in order to pay back the loan that he, uh, Mark Lee had taken from IMF, so we are taking the money from the same one and then paying it back again. So it start it already started in March the repayments. It will end in July two thousand twenty four then the state of Argentina gets a two year grace period. And starting from September, 2026, it will have to pay back the loans in every three months and end in July, 2034. So it's an eight year period in which it has to pay it back. And so that is the sort of situation in which Argentina is and uh, it's already creating a lot of problems in the economy, as well as uh, there are structural, uh, reforms, although, although Alberto Fernandez had promised that there would be no structural reforms. So what can they do now? Okay, the people of Argentina, I hope they can pressure their government to stop or to uh, get, go into a, a separation from IMF or at least declare default, because it has happened in 2001. In late 2001, Argentina, when Argentina was in a terrible situation, it had five presidents in a week. So at that time, Argentina had declared default. Argentina, I mean, they did not die. In fact, after Nestor Kirchner came to the presidency, there was this sort of situation. They had a renegotiation with the IMF. There was a debt reduction. And by the time uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner was leaving government, Argentina did not have any uh, debt with the IMF. So yes, they can follow their own history in order to uh, do anything, like do that sort of thing. And um, I mean, declaring default would be a very good way to do it because it default is nothing it's just it can stop the payments because one can say it will be it will no longer receive any money from imf it does not matter because there are already other powers in place that can give uh, it uh, that can give it some backing for example argentina is going into BRICS. it has the largest economy in the world now china and China has a lot of uh, trades and new trade agreements with Argentina. I don't think Argentine economy will suffer if it declares default. I mean, I'm not an economist, but looking at all these things and looking at examples from history, I think that Argentina can do it, like it can do it because it had happened to other countries. USSR, we can take the example of USSR. In 1918, USSR had refused, like the new Bolshevik government had refused to pay back the loans that the Tsar or the Tsarist regime from beforehand had contracted mainly from European banks and the European institutions. So it did not pay. It said that it would not pay for 30 years and then it will start repayment. But that, that proposal was rejected. However, in starting from the beginning of the 30s, all the European countries were actually having trade relations with the USSR. It isn't like the USSR died because of that reason. So yes, Argentina can look at history its own as well as from other parts of the world and do it now. Let's jump to the other question because we're gonna spend here the whole day. Yes, I, I think <laughs> I need to leave in like 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's jump to the next. I don't know if you wanna add something, Steve. Uh, I just wanna to summarize, say that, that, that Macri uh, Argentina has been in a in a rocky relation with the IMF for decades, and 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 Macri did uh, the unthinkable and debted Argentina more 
than uh, anyone that more than what was allowed even by IMF standards. And that, have, and that money flew the country and left Argentina indebted and without the money. And that money only benefited the elite, the friends of Macri. And now the Argentinians are paying the price with inflation and with adjustments and things that are driving uh, Argentinians crazy. So, so that, that's the only thing that I want to add to that. Uh, I'm going to jump to the next question, which is why is Venezuela sending oil to the U.S.? It's a very, uh, it's a very recurrent comment from our friends. And uh, I know that Steve already mentioned that. Go ahead, Steve, with your line of thought that you mentioned before, and then I follow. Oh, I mean, it was it was just uh, it's just the practical um, necessity. I mean, I know I've, I've especially recently when people are read in the news, you know, that the U.S. diplomats had gone to Venezuela to ask them to sell them oil instead of Russia. You know, and I know a lot of. Some people I know said, "Oh, Venezuela shouldn't send them, shouldn't sell them oil," you know. Uh, um, but it, it's, you know, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. You know, I remember when the first time I went to Cuba, um, and uh, you know, it, it, for me, it was so incredible to be in a country that did not have uh, advertising for McDonald's and didn't have any U.S. companies. Um, uh, you know, and, and I thought it was great and, and amazing. And, and of course, as, I, as anyone who follows Cuba understands that one of the main campaigns of uh, Cuban activists is to end the blockade. So we have to recognize that if the blockade was ended, Cuba would have more U.S. products. I mean, it doesn't mean they would have McDonald's advertising on every corner because the, they don't have commercial advertising in Cuba. But it would certainly allow them to have uh, more access to medicines and all sorts of American made parts that they need to use for, you know, anything from car repair to repairing televisions or computers or whatever. So um, in, in Venezuela, it's just the it's the, the same thing. You have to be practical and, and, and recognize that um, Venezuela's major the, the, the main country that it exported oil to for uh, 50 years was the U.S. Um, it's hugely dependent on the U.S. to refine its oil. Um, and when all that income was cut off, I think it was 98% of its uh, revenue of uh, um, export revenue that was cut off by the loss of the oil sales to the U.S. So, I mean, slowly they've been replacing that with more oil sales to China, but China's on the other side of the country. It doesn't make sense for anyone um, because of the costs incurred of transporting the oil all the way to China or all the way anywhere. The U.S. is the largest consumer of, of oil and it's right next to Venezuela. So it, it's, it, it's just in terms of cost and practicality, um, they, they, they need to. Uh, they need to export oil to Venezuela. And Venezuela, like Cuba, has been fighting for, for years now to have the sanctions lifted so that the economy can breathe, so that uh, you know, the hyperinflation ends, so that um, the, the, the that US goods can be accessed and that the prices of them aren't exorbitant. So yeah, it'd be nice to see the US uh, starved for oil um, by Venezuela, but um, they participate in an international e economy where certain realities have to be um, accepted. Is, and, and it is, a complex uh, reality also, and it, it goes beyond, I mean, what you say is absolutely true, but uh, it goes beyond that, actually. I mean, uh, the Venezuela, Venezuela was an oil reef created by the US to feed their energy needs. That's basically what Venezuela became in economic terms during the whole 20th century. Uh, so, so, so everything in our economic apparatus in Venezuela is aiming, designed, fabricated, thinking on the U.S. needs. We have a kind of oil 
that is very heavy and and we own and, and there are certain refineries in the US in the US that were uh, are owned by Citgo but also by other uh, corporations that are especially designed to process Venezuelan oil or extra heavy oil uh, so I mean there are a lot of things that uh, are connected to the this issue that sometimes people do not analyze because they don't they don't have to know these things you know what I mean uh, but we in Venezuela or many in Venezuela uh, know about these things because this is our daily you know life uh, so so in order for Venezuela to ser to 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 sell oil to other countries to export oil to other countries there had to be certain conditions that whole that that all crude oil have to be refined that uh, that refination needs certain uh, characteristics uh, and not all refineries are prepared to process those things so there are a lot of you know technical issues that are important also to connect to the most important one which is what Steve mentioned uh, that is that people need to eat you know, you know what I mean. I mean, we need to uh, uh, those resources in Venezuela, and and you and you have to be pragmatic about that. Like any other country uh, should be, uh, as Steve said, if, if the Cubans uh, have uh, their their blockade lifted, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Cubans are going to try to sell stuff to to the U.S. Uh, and vice versa. I mean, the gringos are also going to try to sell their stuff to to to, to Cuba, but. But what I'm trying to tell you is that people need to eat. And especially when the conditions are set up to, to make all the exports to the US, like in the case of the Venezuelan oil, is more necessary, uh, the, 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 the necessity uh, of, um, I know that is redundant, but, but uh, of selling that oil to, to, to the US. So so whenever I hear uh, the friends, some friends of us talking about that, I try to explain because it's not like uh, we like if we are uh, quitting uh, or that we are like abandoning our positions. It's just a pragmatic decision of a state, not a person, because personally you can think a lot of things. But a statement, a head of state, like in the case of Maduro or in the case of Hugo Chavez, they have to think about the whole necessity of a country, a population, and things like that. So, 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 I believe that that's important to clarify because I know that some people don't like the idea of us selling back oil to the U.S. But I, I believe that eventually that's going to happen. Uh, but I have to add that there's also a misinformation about this particular issue. I mean, and I believe that it's, it's a misinformation uh, promoted by mainstream media, but also uh, caused by people, journalists not doing the work right. You know what I mean? Sometimes, and what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes there are these off-fact uh, license renewals and a lot of people say oh listen OFAC is releasing sanctions uh, uh, against Venezuela but in reality when you read the 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 the, the, the sanction resolution the OFAC document uh, you realize that they are just extending uh, something that that was issued before so, so, so what I'm trying to tell you is that there's a lot of misinformation about that and, and that I believe that journalists, even leftists, uh, outlets have to be more careful about how to present this news about OFAC renewal of licenses and, and, and actually read the, the letter of, the, of these documents in order to see if there's a change or not. Go ahead. Let, let me interrupt Jesus and just say maybe the question could be reformulated and maybe you could explain. Um, but the, the question put another way is, is Venezuela right now exporting oil uh, exactly. to the U.S.? No, <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that, that, that's the funny thing. Venezuela is not exporting oil to the U.S. yet. 
uh, of course, the gringos uh, and all these delegations that has been sent to Venezuela want that. I'm pretty sure that that's what the gringo wants. And uh, but uh, there was this uh, license approved again by OFAC that allowed any and Repsol to to export oil to European markets in a dev payment basis. It's not like they are doing commercial stuff properly. Uh, they are doing it, it in order to pay uh, uh, debt that they have with PDVSA. I'm, I have to say that uh, all these transnational corporations that operates in Venezuela operates under a minority stake basis. I mean, any corporation operating in Venezuela is subjected to the decisions of PDVSA because PDVSA is the 51% uh, stakeholder in all these uh, joint ventures that has been created to explore oil in Venezuela. And that's something that was designed by, by Hugo Chavez uh, uh, in the in the midst of the first decade of the 21st century so so yes i mean it's, it's, it's a good your question because we haven't started sending oil to the u.s yet but eventually that i believe that that will happen i don't know if you want to add something Sahe. i would just say that well if you if you had looked at the graphs and stuff you would see that just as Venezuelan oil exports to the U.S. was falling because of the sanctions by the U.S., it started with sanctioning PDVSA, as this was mentioned. It started by hitting the oil industry. So just after the sanctions on PDVSA, you'd see that it was Russian oil exports going up in case of the U.S. Like Russia was exporting more oil and like the market that Venezuela had in the U.S. in terms of oil, oil sell, it was taken by Russia now, of course. You know that Russia's, I at least know that Rosneft functions in Venezuela. So it may have been that the oil that they had taken, like they had from Venezuela, the crude they had extracted in Venezuela, they had refined, probably they had sent it to the US in this time. So in, in a roundabout way, Venezuelan oil was reaching the, um, the US and I think in other countries also, in many countries. and. Since, since I mentioned a roundabout way and since um, Steve was talking about the blockade and like ending of blockades and stuff like that, I have to say that blockade is not just about oil or not just about medicine or anything. It's, it, it, is, it becomes like once a country is blockaded, it becomes a reality of everyday life. And um, at present, 40 countries around the world are blockaded. So it becomes blockaded to several degrees, but it becomes a reality in the everyday life. Like let's take, let's see that, for example, for a long time, Venezuela was importing all of its food and most of its import was from the USA. Same case as in, uh, as in Cuba. In fact, in recently I've been listening, I was listening to a Cuban economist who said that their natural market for import of rice was the US. So like it's, it's close, like it's just their neighboring countries, right? So it was the, all the rice that it consumed in Cuba, and Cuba is a very small country with very little amount of land. So all the rice that it has imported, it used to import was from the US. So after the blockade, it cannot import from the US, it imports from China and India, which are on the other side of the world. So first of all, that increases costs. So even if rice from China, from India may cost less in general, in, like in India or China, rice costs a lot lesser than in the US if you use the same currency like to that conversion. Even then, the, um, this export from the Eastern hemisphere to the far Western hemisphere it is um, like a huge logistical cost there. And also the sanctions that the US applies is not just for Cuban companies or for Venezuelan companies, they're also applied extraterritorially. This is also something that has to be mentioned because these are illegal. This makes them illegal. That US can do anything uh, it wishes with its own country. Like it should not be able to sanction companies of other countries 
right? But it happens because it owns the financial system. It is the one that controls the financial system. So it imposes these sanctions on companies of third countries. So these are called third party sanctions. And the shipping companies of China, of India, Russia, um, any country that would wish to export to uh, Venezuela or Cuba or any other sanctioned country would be subjected to the same sanctions, similar kind of sanctions from the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the US Treasury Department. They would seize their assets, they would stop them from going into the US and many other kinds of things, as well as the US Coast Guard following these uh, ships when they're going into Cuba, when they're going into Venezuela, like in the, in the Caribbean region, this happens a lot. <laughs> so it's like something that's unimaginable. And also it increases the costs of everything by five to 10 times or even more. That's true. Like you cannot even, like, in many cases, in case of Cuba, I know this, that the, um, the medicine that they have, they have to assemble it in their own country. They have to get the different components from different countries. And those countries also do not directly send the components to Cuba, fear of fearing sanctions. So they would do it through like other country and other like, so it is just like ship to ship transfer of oil. It's ship to ship transfer of medical components, just imagine, which is supposed to be outside the ambit of sanctions, but it isn't. So, uh, it just increases costs so and it makes things available and accessible a lot less for everyone living in countries under blockade so this is one of the reasons that countries should not be blockaded just for since they talk about humanitarian intervention and humanitarian this and that they should be talking of the humanitarian toll that uh, the sanctions are uh, inflicting on these countries so yes that is the reason why blockades should not exist Let's jump to the next question, Compass. Because... There is a, even more than my mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, what do you all think about Venezuela's relations with the Middle East countries now that President Maduro is in the tour in, in the region? It's from Ananto Biswas in Facebook, I believe. Uh, let me start uh, uh, answering and I, I did pass it to you, Sahi and Steve. Uh, uh, Venezuela, because of his oil exporting nature, uh, I mean, oil exporting country nature, uh, has had intense uh, diplomatic, commercial uh, uh, relations with countries in the Middle East. I mean, the, the, the Middle East, uh, for Venezuela is not uh, something uh, distant. I know that geographically talking, it is distant, but culturally, historically talking, it isn't. So, so whenever we see a Venezuelan president touring uh, the Middle East, for us, is pretty common because uh, our relations with OPEC countries, which most of them were from the Middle East, uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, it started in the early 60s. I mean, when, when the whole idea of OPEC was, you know, uh, presented. So, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I was very excited about the, the visit of, of President Maduro to the Middle East, especially because, uh, especially because right wingers love to say that, uh, that because of the gringos put a price on the head of President Maduro, that Maduro is scared to death to show up somewhere because he is too frightened, too chicken, to, 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 to go outside Venezuela. And, and I believe that, uh, that one of the things that I like the most about whenever Maduro goes abroad, is that, I mean, that he's showing that he's not afraid, but of course it's a, there's a threat. That doesn't mean that there is not a threat. The threat is there and the gringos can do whatever they can, they want. And they have been showing in history that they are capable of anything. They don't have scruples. Is that the word in English? Escrupulos in, in, in Espanol. So they can do whatever, but it shows that, that Maduro has, has enough enough guts to to forget about the that and think about the state issues that he have to deal with as a statement 
and that's what he did. He visited Turkey, he visited Qatar, uh, then he visited Algeria, uh, he also visited uh, uh, Kuwait, I don't remember which other, Iran, of course. Uh, he rem I believe from the Central Asia countries. Azer former Azerbaijan. 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 I was thinking that he was going to go to, to Russia because he announced that trip last year. Uh, 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 part of the delegation, the Venezuelan delegation that arrived to uh, Azerbaijan got COVID. I believe that that might be the reason why he abruptly came back to, to, to Venezuela and he didn't went to, to Russia, but that's my theory, my, my presumption is there's not a fact there. And of course, there's a lot of secrecy in these tours lately, not because uh, we love secrecy, but because the gringos can bomb the plane. <laughs> uh, so, so, so we, uh, you know, uh, whatever less information the Venezuelan government put out there about the plans of President Maduro, the best to safeguard his, you know, physical integrity. So uh, I'm happy because of the, 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 the visit. Uh, we have a cultural, as I say, tied with uh, the Middle East and, and, uh, and the trip to Iran and Turkey were important. And actually President Maduro a few days ago mentioned that uh, Erdogan is coming to Venezuela in the, in the coming days. So, so I'm happy, I'm, 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 I was excited and I was hoping that he visited uh, uh, Russia, but that didn't happen. But President, uh, Vice President uh, Delcy Rodriguez went to, to the forum in St. Petersburg in representation of President Maduro. Go ahead, guys, if you want to add something. Just a little that Chavez, I, I mean, since as Jesus mentioned the oil relations and trade relations, there is also, and also mentioned the cultural relations. So um, in, in times of Hugo Chavez, this thing was reinforced as he visited many countries in the Middle East, including Syria, um, which is like the cradle, of, one of the cradles of human civilization, as well as visited Iraq. So he visited two countries that are like the cradle of human civilization and also like the, um, like the heart of Middle East. So, um, or maybe heart of Eurasia, we would we say it like that, but uh, that's a different thing. Anyway, so um, uh, this time Maduro did not visit those countries, but one can understand why. And uh, I mean, I think that uh, that uh, this sort of relations with the Middle East, not just this visit, but also the relations that already exist, like 40, 50 or more years of relations, uh, 70, 80 years of relations, as well as the fact that um, uh, the Venezuela mm, recognizes only Palestine, and also Venezuela recognizes the Shaharawi Arab Democratic Republic, which is not even a country according to UN and many countries, but Venezuela does those things. So it just shows that in, in these terms that the Bolivarian Revolution supports uh, the popular causes and the causes of liberation, causes of independence in the Middle East that have been thwarted by many, many Western powers for centuries. Uh, so I think that this uh, keeping, I mean, maintaining these relations, continuing these relations and making these relations more visible to everyone is a very important thing. What about you, Steve? Do you wanna add something? You pass? <laughs> okay, okay. I let's, hope let's... there isn't any more question. <laughs> <laughs> let, there are two more, three more. Actually, um, oh, I, 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 uh, now President Maduro, <laughs> what, what, what has the Bolivarian Revolution done with the indigenous and Afro-descendant people of Venezuela? This is a question I from think Yuri. Be Jesus answering this. Yes, let's... sorry, could I interject? I think Charlie needs to go. Okay. I didn't say that I need to go. I mean, I, I think I'd be going, but I think this question should let be me, answered by Jesus because let, he's. Let me do it. Yes, let me do it. And then before that, I want to say hello to Nino and to Arnold and to Evelina that has been writing in Facebook uh, and to Elizabeth also that, that wrote a nice thing about our team on Facebook. You have to look at it whenever you had a chance. So uh, talking about for descendant indigenous people in Venezuela, especially during the, 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 the Bolivarian Revolution, during Chavez time, uh, 
the, the Bolivarian Revolution, the Chavista Revolution, uh, has uh, brought a sense of pride to many Venezuelans that were forgotten by the system, by the previous systems that is very similar to the system that exists right now in Colombia that I hope it changed with Petro, but the system that exists in many Latin American countries in which the elite control the country and the poor people, the black people, the indigenous people are treated as marginal stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, with Chavez, when Chavez came to power in Venezuela, he not only gave visibility to those groups, he empowered them. I know that that word sometimes is not liked by many in uh, progressive friends, but he empowered, he gave, gave them voice and rights within the new uh, Bolivarian constitution that was approved in, in 2000. 2001, I believe. Uh, so so uh, just to give you an example, when Chavez came to power, uh, there was this electrical uh, grid uh, system that was built between Venezuela and Brazil that needed to pass through indigenous lands. That project was stopped uh, for like three or four years Yes, because the new constitution gave the indigenous people the rights to decide if they wanted that project to pass through their lands or not. At the end, there was a negotiation with the government, uh, with Brazil, and uh, the project advanced. But what I'm trying to tell you is that the, the Bolivarian constitution gave uh, indigenous people the right to, to, to be seen to say a word about things affecting them directly is completely the opposite of what happened in Canada, for example. When these indigenous peoples in Canada are struggling and, and trying to make a lot of noise and only us, you know, alternative independent media cover uh, that, uh, th that, that uh, those protests because mainstream media most of the time just show a, a tiny fraction of those protests and don't doesn't show the, the the arbitrary you know police repressions and you know decisions that are taken without consulting the the indigenous people so so those things change in venezuela with the chavista with chavez and and i believe that also that have also a relationship with the afrodescendant community uh, uh the the venezuelan afrodescendants were also treated like i mean there's racism everywhere even in in latin america especially because we con our countries have been most of them uh, ruled by uh, oligarchies that are most of them white or or creole uh you know oligarchs that are very racist and of course that racism uh tickles down the country. Uh, and, and that's the only thing that tickles down uh, and, and, uh, and not the wealth. And, and in the case of uh, the Afro-descendant community, uh, Chavismo uh, made a lot of changes in the legal framework to recognize Afro-descendants, indigenous, uh, those uh, minority groups uh, as groups of interest, groups that needed to be treated uh, better than the rest because they were in the conditions of uh, indefensión. We say it in Spanish, I don't know the word. Uh, indefensión is where, that they were defendless. Is that a word in English? Okay, so 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 Venezuela and uh, okay okay the chavismo uh, uh, provide these groups with uh, legal tools to not only to have visibility but also to demand to demand uh, uh, rights to be respected. So of course we are not perfect. There are still a lot of 
uh, indigenous and racist issues associated to Afro-descendant communities and, and you know, uh, inequalities that, that are structural that has been there and have not been fixed. Those things are still there, but I believe that from what we had before Hugo Chavez uh, to what we have now, there is a big change. Of course, I know that we can do better, but there's a, 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 a humongous improvement in the in the in the presence in the voice of these groups uh, that these groups have right now. So that's the thing that I could say. I don't know if you want to add something to that. After this question, we have still two more questions, and we're ready to go, Sahili. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I, I would just say that uh, in terms of visibility, at least Chavez himself said that he was Afro descendants. So that was a that mm. was that could be a source of pride for many. That, that for like after two almost two centuries of independence, you have an Afro descendant person as the head of state. And, not and Afro a, also a... he called himself Bachaco. Bachaco for us is the mix of white, uh, indigenous, and black people, and he yeah, called yeah, himself he was... Bachaco. So he was a he was a representative of everyone like that, and not only like not he's not just a head of state of Venezuela. Like I already mentioned, he was a leader for the entire region Did you kill as it? well as <laughs> the mosquito. <laughs> I'm joking. As as well as for other other parts of the world also. So it's like, um, like when he said that he was an Afro descendant, he was indigenous. That was something that. Uh, that was that itself was a big visibility now of course a lot of people would say that just because the head of state is african does not mean that the, the people's conditions would be improved but he did the things that uh, were that were needed to improve the conditions of these people so that's that's very important i'd say that in case of agrarian reform that the people who were most uh, uh, like who gained the most in terms of agrarian reform were these these groups as well as like all sorts of poor people, but you'd see that in all countries, the racial minorities are the ones that are mostly represented among the poorest groups. So I'd say that uh, reforms like the agrarian reform, that free education, healthcare, all these things were the real things that uh, impacted and made the lives of these people better who had been forgotten for so long. Yes, now that you mentioned that, I want to add uh, that I forgot to mention, for example, elections. In Venezuela, the elections are uh, for indigenous people are, are, are done respecting their traditions, like where they usually, it's not like they go voting, no, they have their assemblies, uh, they respect the ways, the traditional ways. I forgot to mention that. Only. Yes, yes, I think there is a, there are autonomous systems for them. Mm. So that's, that's something like, just like they are like, their autonomous regions and stuff. They also have their autonomous electoral system. Of course, these are they they are also related to the to the, the main system. But I think that uh, I have seen that always that it is like they take uh, would be taking a week or like seven eight days more mm -hmm. to declare the results, and uh, they have um, like special representation in the national assembly as well as the other bodies that are replicated in the state level as well as the municipal ones yes. so that that's very important like it's just not representation but representation with rights representation with uh, things that are really important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah i think i would leave at this because if i go on <laughs> go ahead Sahili. go ahead go ahead thank you we are about to finish anyway okay thank you thanks a lot to Don't everyone worry. who has followed i know like i know evelina and she had been following us for a long time and I know her also. So thanks a lot, even in, uh, to Arnold, to Nino, to, uh, I don't know, I mean, a lot of people, like Camila, Camila is also following. So, and there is also John Mark Considine. I think I, I hope I pronounced his name right. So those are the people that I, I have seen following. There might be many others, as well as all the ones who questioned, sent questions. Yuri, I think Yuri is watching a football match, so he could not <laughs> see it now, but I <laughs> hope that he will see it later. So thanks a lot to you all, and thanks a lot to uh, Horinoko Tribune for all the opportunities and stuff. Un abrazo, so, Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm missing. We love you. Don't worry. We understand.
Do you want to add Thank something, you, Steve? I know that should be going also. Do you want to add something to what Sahili said about Afro and indigenous people? Yeah, uh, I'll add something. Thank you, Shahili. Um, just really quickly in Canada, we have the case of Crystal X, a huge Canadian gold mining company that I think in 2007, I believe it was, um, had their permit to exploit um, gold reserves in the uh, Imataka Reserve. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you read the Western media, they're just going to tell you that um, Chavez wanted to uh, expropriate all the company's properties and so on. But the reality is that this permit was revoked because the Karimia people there in the Imataka Reserve did not agree to the um, expropriation or the use of their land and because of the environmental concerns of the gold mine. So that's just one small example that, you know, I learned a little bit about um, right. uh, indigenous uh, activism in Venezuela through, through that story. So I would look uh, or encourage anyone else to look online, read up about Crystal X, Imataka, the Carina people, because there's actually been a lot of non-Venezuelan, Western and environmental outlets and organizations that have reported on that story in a, you know, in a, in a way that, in a pro-Chavista way that have come to the defense of the Venezuelan government for how they stood up for the rights of the people and of the environment. So it's just one case. Yes, that's a good point, especially in the mining area, which is a very, uh, you know, critical neurologic area. Uh, and a lot of people, uh, even, left-wingers sometimes criticize the government for the uh, mining arc of Orinoco mining arc and, the, and they try to misrepresent the whole idea in order to attack um, Maduro and Chavez uh, because I believe that the work of Maduro is a continuation of what Chavez was trying to do in the area that is uh, plagued with uh, illegal mining which is the worst environmental threat than anything but anyway uh, you, I, I, let's jump to the next question and it is from Fra Hughes a good friend and writer uh, he presented the question of, via Twitter and he asked when will the multilateral world order of cooperation nations become a reality <coughs> <coughs> sorry and will the Belt and Road project in Eurasia you share it in I mean uh, uh, what would you say about that, Steve, that you love the issue of multilateralism? Um, I would say first thanks to Fra Hughes from Ireland for his contributions and his writing. Um, regarding this question, uh, when will the multipolar world order become a reality? Um, and will the Belt and Road project usher it in? I, you know, uh, I would say the answer is it has already become a reality and um will the belt and road project usher it in i mean it is doing um the belt and road project and the emergence of the multipolar world order um are these are slow processes um it's not like one day a, a, a switch gets flicked and we go suddenly from being in the unipolar world to being in the multipolar world um, but I think the major hurdles, uh, the major defining moments um, have happened in the last couple of years. First, just to make this clear to people, because I know everyone's talking about these terms lately, unipolar, multipolar. Generally, it's understood that after that during the uh, so-called Cold War um, that we lived, let's say, uh, in a uh, bipolar world, um, meaning two poles of power, the, the US and its allies, uh, the capitalist world, totally and good. the USSR and its allies, the communist world. With the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990, 91, uh, you had the emergence of a so-called unipolar world, meaning there was only one large world power, the US. Um, as you know, imperialists are, uh, or anti-imperialists, I think we realize that the, the goal of fighting imperialism is to um, counteract that one major power uh, for everyone to unite against it and try to break its uh, hegemonic hold on um, the world economy. So I would say that the, for me, the, you know, I, I've been thinking of this idea of the day the, um, the day the unipolar world ended, 
Um, it's an article I still didn't get around to writing, but I would say that um, there are some key days uh, that symbolically this US dominated world ended. And I would say one was the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, 2021, just because it really exposed the US democracy internally for being very fragile. Um, and their whole idea that they were exporting democracy and freedom to other countries and that they could you know, use uh, their military to do so kind of was exposed as a sham. The whole Trump presidency really um, and the popularity and the need within the US itself for this sort of uh, neo-fascism, I think really exposed how rotten to the core the US imperialist project was. The second thing I think that event that marked the end of the US dominated unipolar world was um, the, the um, cementing of agreements between China and Russia that occurred um, in February, I think first it was in June 2021 that they renewed their friendship and cooperation agreement. And then it was right before the Olympics. So in February 2022, that they issued a very long and detailed declaration, basically um, saying that Russia and China together uh, would form an unbreakable partnership. And I, th I think it was, you know, those two things uh, together that have led us to where we are now with the Russian special military operation in Ukraine, which is another big step um, and say what you will about you know military operations and and so on of course i think everyone would, would like to see changes happen in a, a peaceful way whether it would be possible or not but the the fact that russia had the courage or the whatever you want to call it had the audacity to launch this operation i think is is a huge indication that we are now living in a multipolar world yes yes i agree with you completely i mean I, I believe that, that we have been talking a lot about multipolarity. The other day when I was in, in a podcast, in a show with uh, Ben Norton, he brought out a, a speech from Chavez. I believe that the speech was from 99 or 2000, 2001, something like that. And he was amazed by Chavez talking about multipolarity even then. I mean, and I, I, I mean, since Chavez was in power, multipolarity was his thing. I mean, when, whenever he talked about international issues, I know that he didn't coin the, 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 the word. I, 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 I understand that the word comes uh, from the academia, but anyways, I mean, uh, you can have a lot of words in the academia, but if anyone talks about those words, you know, nothing changes. So you need people, especially uh, influence, you know, influential people to talk about those, you know, those words, those ideas in order to, you know, provoke a change. And I believe that that's what has been happening in recent years. A lot of people talking about multipolarity, actually Ben Norton's website is multipolarista and, and, and that word doesn't come out of the blue is especially because he also believe in, in the necessity of a multipolar order, not in order to achieve socialism, because that doesn't mean that multipolarity is going to take us to communist paradise. But at least it's like, like when we talk about the BRICS, at least it will bring, and, and BRICS is uh, our component of the, the multipolarity concept, uh, whenever we achieve multipolarity, that uh, uh, I believe as Steve said that we are very firmly going into that direction, uh, we at least uh, are not going to be ruled by one country and especially the US that is so corrupted, so uh, lost in its belief of being the, the light or the, I don't know how to, the beacon of the world, the, the beacon of freedom and, and the exceptional people on earth that are better than anyone. Uh, I mean, I believe that, uh, that only with that scene changing, you know, with the appearance of, with the existence of, of a multipolar order, uh, the world is gonna be a little bit better. Even, even though these other powers that will be, you know, uh, having 
uh, a presence in the international scenario do not do much. At least knowing that the US is not controlling everything is gonna be a big change. So, so I believe that that it is that is happening, Fra, and I believe that uh, China have a lot of things to do with that, of course. And the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, an important tool, also, but not the only one. Yeah. I mean, they're they're like a they're Belt and Road bricks. Uh, they are like like maybe maybe three or four, you know tools, organizations that are out there trying to give shape to this multipolar world. And as Steve said, there are also some, some milestones, you know, uh, that, that can uh, serve as evidence to show that we are moving towards that path. I hope that Steve finally uh, finished his writing about multipolarity because he writes great. Uh, the last question, finally, Steve. This is from Nino Pagliacchi. I actually have another question. Ah, no I'm kidding. Facebook. Okay, okay. Why don't we take this question first before we go, go to that last one? But go ahead. Go Evelina ahead. asks on Facebook, uh, can you confirm or deny the news that Iran, China, and Russia will be participating in joint military exercises in Venezuela in August? That that that's something that was published uh, uh, here in the media in Venezuela uh, covering uh, reports from a website in the US. Uh, the Venezuelan government haven't said anything about that, but they usually don't say too much about those things ahead. I mean, ahead of time, especially because of our uh, friendly relations with the US. Uh, so, so I believe that we won't know for sure until August, <laughs> if you ask me, or a few days, I mean, you know, uh, before the exercise happened, but I really believe that that will happen. I, I, I have, a, but, but one might be, uh, uh, you know, uh, run, uh, you know, uh, but uh, we covered that uh, news information that was spreading in Venezuela in recent days, and we publish it uh, whenever we see it uh, uh, on the news here in Venezuela and in the US. Uh, but we don't have uh, yet, you know, official confirmations about the, 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 the deal happening, but I will love if that happened because uh, a lot of people really know that's a provocation today. What provocation? I mean, uh, what I mean, provocation is what the U.S. do every day, sending planes through our borders, uh, you know, spying telecommunications planes through our borders, sending ships through our uh, uh, waters, uh, uh, intercepting shipments of oil that come from Iran. Uh, you know, uh, that's provocation. That's actually uh, the blockade sanctions are acts of war. And if we have been threatened as, as we have been by the US with military action, as was confessed by Spears, the former Secretary of Defense in his book that the, the Trump wanted to invade Venezuela and to, and to bomb some refineries and kill some Chavista leaders. Uh, the last thing that we can do is to uh, organize ourselves uh, to defend the country. And if we do it with our uh, international allies better, and if those international allies are powerful, like with like Iran or like Russia, more I mean, more better. I don't know if that work. If you have to, you can say that in English. But, but anyway, yeah. I mean, what I'm trying, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's going to be better for us if we do that. Uh, uh, and I believe that it's going to connect with military exercises that also I read. And in, in this sense, the Nicaraguan government has been more explicit that are gonna happen in Nicaragua soon also. And there's also a lot of noise and criticism even by some leftists about Nicaragua allowing Russian troops to participate in extraterritorial presence in their country. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of news coverage has been happening in recent months about that issue. And, uh, and no one talks too much about uh, several other countries having the same presence in that decision uh, with Russia. I mean, uh, 
the Nicaraguan government allowed not only Russia, but Venezuelan, uh, Spanish, US troops within that decision, in that decision of allowing the presence of military forces in, in Nicaragua were not only Russian troops. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, they were also uh, Venezuelan troops allowed, US troops, I mean, I mean, there was like this executive decision approved by the, the, the Sandinista government uh, that was basically the continuation, the renovation of an old uh, decision, a, 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 an old executive order that in this case added Russia. And the Nicaraguans also have the right to organize themselves to defend their country because they have been threatened a lot by the US. What do you expect us to do? to sit here and wait for an invasion. I mean, we need to prepare uh, in the case that uh, those crazy guys in, in Gringolandia want to invade us. So that's my take on that particular question, Steve. I don't know if you want to add something that I might be missing. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for the information right now to confirm what I remember or vaguely remember reading about a couple of weeks ago, or it was less, it was just uh, yes. eight days ago that uh, we reported. And the headline we reported was um, Iran, Russia, and China to carry out military drills in Venezuela. Um, Iran's uh, press TV reported it in the same way uh, that unequivocally these drills will happen. Um, so, I mean, they might not, I suppose, but the news out there is that they're gonna happen. Um, yeah. What I remember doing a bit of research is that this drill is called Sniper Frontier um, and maybe other people can look this up also. My internet's like behaving strangely right when I need it here. But these drills have been going on for years. I think they began in 2017. Again, it could be 2018. And they include more countries than it. it's not just, you know, um, Iran and Russia and China that all of a sudden the three of them are, are coming. It, it includes 10 other countries. It was reported this year and in the past it included seven or eight other countries such as Uzbekistan, uh, Belarus. In 2021, it was Vietnam that hosted these same military operations that ha that occurred at the same time of the year in August. So you can read about the Sniper Frontier competition in Vietnam. It's an annual thing. Um, so the idea that it would happen in Venezuela is not uh, it's not a, a an outlandish idea. I think it's that's probably what's going to happen, and there's probably going to be a lot of news shared about it once it's done. I, I, I hope it happens because that, that will send a message to the gringos that this is not their backyard. Only because of that, I will be happy. <laughs> Let's it's the type of statement that uh, Putin has been making also recently about, uh, you know, Russia is, is not scared and the U.S. is going to have to recognize that uh, other countries other than the U.S. can exercise... Um, um, military force in and uh, the, the Americas and in, in other countries uh, of the world. So I mean, with those statements, I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it's it's going to happen. Yes, yes, yes. It's good. You know, the last comment I'll make, maybe in relation to this and the multipolar uh, bipolar world, and I think this is like a really long and interesting conversation, but. Um, I guess there's the question always is, are we emerging into a multipolar world or are we emerging into another bipolar world? A lot of people have been characterizing what's happened over the last few years as the new Cold War. And if it is the new Cold War, then that means that, um, you know, you have a, a bipolar world where you have Russia and China on one side and the US and its allies on, on the other side. And I think maybe one of the lessons that we can take from Hugo Chavez is that you know it's important to I think keep emphasizing this idea of um, a multipolar world, just like the non-aligned movement that emerged in the 1950s to speak up for the interests of global South um, nations and peoples. You know, the U.S. media is always going to try to frame these stories as in it's just Venezuela, Iran, China, and Russia, and they're going to force uh, countries to take sides, just like they did with the the um, the uh, operation in Ukraine, they're going to force countries to either sanction Russia or to be um, sanctioned by the US. 
and they're going to try to um, divide everyone amongst themselves and to make a simple black and white uh, bipolar world where they can attack um, other countries who don't bend to their will for being allied with uh, China or Russia. So I think it's important to remember and to encourage the idea that there is room for nuance in there. There's, there's 190 countries in the world. Each one of them has its own complex um, ge geopolitical and political relations with others and with the United Nations. And things aren't always super clear like we were uh, learning with the discussion of BRICS earlier, for example. Yes, yes that's true, that's true. Let's see what happened, but I, I'm hopeful that uh, that we will, in our life time span, see this multipolar war. If I say it right, I think we're course. seeing it. You know, we're seeing it being born. Um, yes, we're yes. here to witness history. Is it's happening? It happens slowly, and we're going to look back on the things that have happened in the last couple of years. I mean, COVID is another thing too. You know, you you look at a, the. U.S. death toll of a million people, where where uh, China is like well, whatever they're in the uh, maybe now they're at ten thousand. Uh, I haven't checked the numbers lately, but I mean this was a huge blow to U.S. Uh, That's true. Hegemony that anyone That's could another, anywhere could That's go on the scene. internet and see that hundreds writing. of thousands of people were were dying there. Yes, yes. Uh, write it down. To add it to your writing. I believe that is important. The one, the thing that you just said about the the coronavirus. That's true. Okay, let's finish. Finally, Nino. Sorry. So your the question of Nino Pandiglia is about a piece that was published uh, by Venezuela Analysis a few days ago about the Bene Chevron being in talks with Venezuelan authorities to uh, have a change in the structure in this. Uh, uh, shareholder structure of the joint ventures that they have here in Venezuela, allegedly in order to bypass U.S. sanctions. The name of the article that Venezuela Analysis published, and I encourage everyone to read Venezuela Analysis, which is the 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 first uh, uh, newspaper. A news website with Venezuelan information about Venezuela in English, venezuelanalysis.com. And the name of the piece uh, is Venezuela Oil Output Extagnates Despite Export Search, Chevron Continues PDVSA Talks. So this is the piece that uh, Nino is talking about. And he was like alarmed by the, basically by the, the possibility of uh, uh, what the the article says, and the article said uh, um, using as a sort uh, Bloomberg, uh, and 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 Bloomberg uh, wrote what I just told you that that uh, Chevron is in talks with Venezuelan authorities uh, in order to have a, a fifty one percent or so from the from the joint ventures that they have with PDVSA in order allegedly to to bypass US sanctions and start operations. Uh, I, I believe, I mean, anything can happen in this particular, you know, a scenario of trying to bypass sanctions. And Venezuela uh, 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 has been learning a lot of things in recent years to bypass sanctions. So I believe that, that I mean, I, I, if you I, I, if you ask my opinion about that particular possibility, I believe that is not very easy to happen, especially because the government will have to change organic laws. Of course, we have the majority in the parliament, but uh, there's a sense among Chavista people that that the organic law of uh, hydrocarbons that was approved by Hugo Chavez is very positive for the government. So, so I don't think that there will be like enough uh, popular support to a change uh, of a decision of this kind in Venezuela. I'm not saying that it could not happen. I believe that it, it could happen. Uh, but I also believe that Venezuela doing this is basically uh, if if this is if this is true, which I believe is not 
uh, very true. Uh, I believe that, uh, I mean, Venezuela is gonna be sending a, 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 a bad signal about how to bypass sanctions. You know what I mean? We has already been bypassing sanctions. We don't need to twist the law and to give more power to these corporations, US corporations, in order to get and to reach the US market again. I believe that uh, reaching the US market is going to happen eventually because the gringos are in a very bad economic shape at this moment. Uh, and, and, and that's my opinion about this, uh, this particular issue, Nino. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something to that, Steve. Maybe I'm forgetting some, forgetting something, but no, no, honestly, no. I don't, I don't have much, much to add to this. But anyway, Nino, I believe that that uh, I mean, what a Venezuela analysis uh, was trying to do is to to present this information that was initially uh, presented by Bloomberg. And maybe there are, of course, the interest. I mean, and Bloomberg do, do, do not represent the interests of the, the people, any people at all. So they might be <clears throat> representing the interests of Chevron. And maybe there is some guy in Chevron trying to push that, that idea. That's why these you know, outlets usually do. They have their friends in, in high positions, in, in corporations, in, 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 in global North countries, and they just uh, represent their interest. And maybe this is just Chevron people trying to push this idea. But I believe that the idea is not going to happen, if you ask me, because of what I told you, because we have been already trying to uh, bypass uh, U.S. sanctions. We have authorization to to export oil to to Europe at this moment, and uh, and uh, and changing the law is going to be like a, a, a not, not an easy decision for Maduro's government. So, uh, and it's not going to be an easy decision for the country itself, for the state itself. So, so I believe that this is not going to happen. But who knows? Thank you guys. I believe that we have reached the, we, we have been talking for almost two hours, Steve. You talk too much. I don't uh, know what, yeah, what I'm gonna do with you. <laughs> just to close up, uh, it's been almost three hours, not almost two hours. Oh my just, God, just yes, clear. three hours. Yes, that's uh, that's true. Latin American time here, <laughs> two hours. Two hours on Latin American time and, and three Western, hours in Northern uh, <laughs> time. It's been just about three hours. That's I wanted true. to reiterate say thanks to everyone you know that tuned in and that to all the readers and followers of Orinoco Tribune uh, I wanted to also reiterate um, our content could be found on our website orinocotribune.com and once again that we're entirely uh, funded by the donations of our supporters and followers so you can help us out by sharing our content you can help us out by volunteering anyone's welcome to use the information on the website if you want to volunteer and help us out and mostly you can help by um, contributing uh, even just a small monthly amount and you can learn all about that on the website or knucletribune.com but we have no ads we don't monetize any of our social media content and we don't have any government connections within Venezuela or anywhere that are helping us out and giving us funds so I just wanted to reiterate all that yes yes and we are happy of our independence and we are proud of our independence you know uh, it gives you uh space to breathe yeah because i'm telling you this because even with small donations sometimes people feel entitled because they give you a donations to to tell you what to do and not to do and uh, we don't allow that to happen in orinoco tribune we of course accept suggestions we accept criticisms, we read the, the suggestions and criticisms and try to take them into consideration, but no one is dictating us what to do. And I believe that it's important. Uh, and I just to finish, wanna thank everyone that have the time to, to watch us uh, or we watch us later. Uh, and I wanna invite you to for tomorrow that we're gonna have another event that I mentioned you uh, the fifth uh, editorial, uh, OT editorial uh, talk about Palestine. 
Uh, we are going to have a, a great guest, uh, a Palestinian activist, uh, and we hope to see you tomorrow. It's going to be at 12 uh, in the, at noon, Easter time. Un abrazo. Be safe.